Chapter 18 of The Gentle Art of Faking by Ricardo Novelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. Chapter 18 The Faked Atmosphere and Public Sales. The Art of Producing a Faked Atmosphere. Private Sales of Faked Objects of Art. Real and spurious noblemen as elements in creating the desired atmosphere for an antique. The various and endless possibilities in private dealing. Public sales. Auction sales. Various characters among frequenters of public sales. La bande noire. The trick of the sale catalogue as a proof of authenticity, etc. The part played in public sales by Peter Funk and the transformations of this helpful personage. In most cases, the art forger is provided with an indispensable accessory in the person of a co-worker who helps to dispose of the artist's questionable product advantageously. This may be done by one agent or by many, according to circumstances, but the spirit of the mission is always the same, to steep faking, namely in another kind of fakery, no less elusive and delusive, the deception that serves to misguide judgment through false information about some particular object of art or to create a misleading suggestion around the work of art offered for sale. The trick may be termed producing a faked atmosphere, in plain words, the creation of a false atmosphere of genuineness is an additional fakery to the success of a faked object of art or curio, and it is a most multiform species of imposture and a very dangerous adjunct to the already deceptive trade. So multifarious is the deception practiced that an attempt to classify it in its diversity would probably fail to illustrate in full the metamorphoses of this supplement to the art of faking. As this support to faking is chiefly concerned with the sale of objects of art, our investigation can be broadly divided according to the kind of sale, private or public, the latter generally taking the form of an auction. In private sales, the limit is not so much set by the seller's conscience as his inventive powers and his more or less fertile imagination. His method relies mainly on the power of suggestion brought about by false information or, as we have said, by the silent misleading glamour of a pseudo-environment. The former works principally with the decoy of invented documents calculated to lend certain objects an appearance of historical worth or wrongly to magnify their artistic importance. It is not always the documents that are fitted to the faked art, sometimes the case is reversed and the artist creates work to fit a genuine document. The same is done with signatures, more especially in painting and sculpture. There are all kinds of specialists in the world of faking who can imitate artists' signatures, marks and so forth, but alas it is not said that to a genuine signature our versatile and imaginative artist cannot supply a genial piece of fraud, the only genuine part of which is represented by the signature. This is often performed by painting over works that have been defaced, either partially or completely, and yet by some chance still bear the artist's signature in one corner, generally the least abused spot of a painting, whether on canvas or panel. The same trick is carried out with equal facility in sculpture. To illustrate what at first sight would seem more complex than fitting a painting to a signature, it is sufficient to recall the false Claudian group, sold in perfectly good faith by Monsieur Mallet de Boulet to Madame Bois, also a dealer, whose experience, like that of many others, had a noisy sequel in court. Monsieur Mallet de Boulet had bought the clay group some years previously. The subject, a satyr with a nymph, was of the kind that the French call a pouleste. For five years, Madame Bois found no buyer. It was after this long period of actual possession that she discovered the clay statuette to be not by Claudian, but in all probability the work of a noted faker of Claudian's, Le Broc, and that a small bit bearing the signature and date, both by the hand of Claudian, had been cleverly inserted at the side of the group. The line of the join had been concealed by colour and patina. The purchase money, however, was not refunded, as the court accepted the theory advanced by Monsieur Senard, acting for Monsieur Boulet, that Madame Bois had after all enjoyed the possession of the group for five years, and had perhaps put forward her claim because she had not been able to sell it on account of its objectionable character. 
In the cases where the documents are the original ones and the work of art is not, the artist naturally creates his work in accordance with the indications given in the documents. The occurrence is not common, but it has nevertheless taken place. We have heard of a man ordering a portrait to be painted to fit a detailed description of one of his ancestors given in an old letter. The Florentine Prioristi and old diaries as well can be used for the purposes of such suggestion. An old family chronicle recorded a marriage with some detail, sufficient at any rate to inspire an art counterfeiter to model a small bas relief representing the scene. When the work was suitably coated with old patina, put in a 16th century frame and an old worm-eaten board fastened to the back, the authentic document was carefully pasted on as proof of genuineness. Possible combinations of this sort of scheme are endless and can be applied to almost every expression of curio dealing. What we have styled faking the milieu in order to enhance the value of a genuine article or to give additional effect to a falsified one trades upon the fact that a collector prefers to buy from a private house rather than a shop. This often appeals to him as convincing proof that the article is genuine and it also appears to confer a higher value by comparison with the surroundings in a shop. To humour this particular trait in the collector, environments have been faked as well as objects of art, and in the evil grand art we are illustrating they furnish today more often than not the proper dignity which aids highly profitable sales affected through private transaction. When a work leaves the faker's hands, there are many ways in which to give birth to the false and elusive dignity designed to lend importance and an air of genuineness. One of the simplest methods is to provide the work with a respectable passport in the person of a patrician, real or faked, according to opportunities. This decoy is prepared, of course, to swear that the object has been in his family for centuries. When the mansion is really old and the family of ancient lineage, success is practically assured. How a man can lend his name to such deception can only be explained by a form of degeneracy which, unfortunately, is not extremely rare in our times. It is known to be practised with proper genuine works and with forgeries. In the former case it helps the command of an extravagant price that would never be reached in a shop or through the hands of a dealer. In the latter, working through suggestion, it serves to dispel any lingering doubt from the buyer's mind. When it appears difficult to bring off the deal, in the case of forgery, the object is taken to the country by preference and placed in some old villa or mansion with the connivance of a genuine nobleman, who will receive a secret visit from the purchaser. All act in the antiquarian world, it must be remembered, savour of mystery and secrecy and play the dignified part of a member of a time-honoured family who collected works of art in years past. A sham nobleman may also give himself out as Count So-and-so and safely act the part for a day or even a few hours. It must be borne in mind that this course of working by suggestion is very dangerous to the purchaser. By its silent and convincing method, art antiquaries of skill and veteran connoisseurs have been deceived. Another application of this deceptive scheme that relies on a favourable environment to help fraud is the sending of counterfeit objects to remote country places supposed to be unexplored. This also is based upon a psychological peculiarity in some collectors who still hope and believe that there are yet unsearched regions in the world of antiques, oases that have escaped the ever-vigilant eye of the trader. As a matter of fact, if anything like neglected corners exist where one may hope for a find, they are in large cities such as Paris or London, particularly the latter, where even Italian antiquaries go at times to hunt for what it would be hopeless to seek in their own country. Be it understood, the above two ways of disposing in private of pretended genuine antiquities are likely to be combined. The nobleman who charitably houses the masterpiece that the amateur is after completes the stage-like effect of the hatched environment with sham documents, etc. Among public sales it is, as we have said, the auction sale that offers the greatest possibility to those who falsify an atmosphere to put the client on the wrong track so profitably to the faker. As may readily be seen, a false environment and any tampering with the elements that go to the formation of a right opinion 
as regards an objet d'art, invariably lead not only to the acquisition of the wrong thing, but to the payment of an exorbitant price for its worthlessness. Much that is amusing and that would bring home this point could be written on public sales. Enough to fill a bulky volume could be culled from what has taken place at the Atrium Auctionarium to the modern Hotel Duo or the historical sale room still extant and busy in London. Cicero tells us that one of the first auctions to be held in Rome was the sale of property that Sulla had seized from prescribed Romans. He also tells us with his usual rhetorical emphasis that all Pompey's property was put up to auction and disposed of to the highest bidder by the Praeco's lacerating voice. This great sale included a large portion of Mithridates' treasure, the catalogue of which cost 30 days work to the Roman officials who took the objects in charge. At this sale, at Cicero, with redoubled emphasis, Rome forgot her state of slavery and freely broke into tears. It may be, but Mark Antony, to be sure, took advantage of this supposed public emotion and had all the valuable lots knocked down to himself at ridiculously low figures. Some of them, it is said, were never paid for at all by this audacious triumvir. Another famous auction sale in Rome was that of Jubba, king of Numidia, who left his treasure to Rome in the time of Tiberius. Caligula was his own auctioneer, and in this way disposed of furniture in his imperial palace that he considered out of fashion. His example was followed by Marcus Aurelius, who sold in the public square dedicated to Trajan the jewels and other precious objects forming part of Hadrian's private effects. In order to pay his troops, Pertinax put up to public auction all Commodus's property, a most confusing medley of imperial effects, an omnium gatherum ranging from the deceased emperor's gorgeous robes to the gladiatorial array he used in the circus, and from his court jester to his slaves. Perhaps the most remarkable part of the sale was Commodus's original and interesting collection of coaches, an odd assemblage that should have been capable of stirring even Julius Caesar's blasé mind, who, it is said, used to attend sales in quest of emotion. They afforded him a certain stimulation, for Suetonius speaks of him as rather a rash and unwise bidder. Caligula's coaches were of all kinds and shapes. There were some for summer, with complex contrivances to shelter from the sun and cool the air by means of ventilators, and some for winter devised in such a way as to give protection from cold winds. Others were fitted with a device that would now be called a speedometer, a contrivance for measuring the distance covered by the vehicle. The mania for sales went so far with the Romans that at the death of Pertinax, the empire itself was put up to auction and knocked down to the highest bidder, Didius Julianus. Although not so complex as the modern houses of public sale, the Roman atrium auctionarium was not simplicity itself. The original auction sales of the Romans consisted of the disposal of war spoils to the highest bidder, in the open air on the battlefield or in a square of some conquered city. In order to indicate the spot where the sale was to take place, a lance was driven into the ground. The name of subhasta was therefore given to these rudimentary auction sales, which is the etymology of the Italian word asta, still used for auctions. The tabulae auctionarii, giving daily notice of the number and description of objects offered for sale, were in some way the forerunners of the modern catalogue, just as the preco might be considered the ancestor of the auctioneer, or maybe the creer. There were also amanuenses who wrote down prices and purchasers' names as each lot was sold. Marshall tells of a curious incident at an auction in which a girl slave was offered for sale. When the bidding failed to elicit a higher offer, Galanius, the celebrated auctioneer, ended his eulogy of the beauty of the human merchandise by giving the young slave a couple of kisses. What happened, said Marshall in his conclusion, a buyer who had just made a bid of 600 sesterces on the girl immediately withdrew his offer. Times are changing. 
it is no longer a question of selling slaves in our modern atrium autionarium, but the auction room itself has nevertheless remained about the same, a great place of interest, an assemblage of types such as old Tongilius, Licinius and Paulus, who, revived and modernised, gather in our sale rooms, elbowing the crowds of bidders, among whom are shrewd, clever buyers, true, impassioned collectors, cool and self-possessed customers. The auction room is no less freakish than in olden times. There may be, in fact, reason in the refusal to bid for young slaves that the buyer considers defiled by the kisses of the auctioneer, even if he were a Galanius the man a la mode but we can find none for instance in what happened some years ago at the celebrated castellani sale in rome on account of castellani's high reputation among collectors and the fine things offered this sale gathered to rome a cosmopolitan crowd of connoisseurs while a fine cafagiolo vase was under the hammer the employee who was exhibiting it to the public dropped it and it broke to pieces at the moment of the accident the object had just been sold to the last bidder who naturally enough immediately declared his offer cancelled as he had made a bid on a sound vase and not a heap of debris the auctioneer then proposed to put the fragments of the vase up to auction and a fresh start was made strange to say the second bidding reached a higher figure than the vase had fetched when offered to the public intact and in all its faultless beauty but for the consideration that the second sale may have tempted some who regretted that they had let slip the chance to bid on the fine cafagiolo one would be inclined to deduce that in the world of curios an object acquires more worth the more it is damaged it is true that while a broken china vase is practically worthless a piece of finance does not lose value by being broken and put back together again if it does not actually rise in value as in the case of the castellani cafagiolo though to an outsider the auction room may doubtlessly appear very simple in mechanism it is rather a complex affair its atmosphere has engendered any amount of side speculation this is the more marked in such sales rooms as have by reason of the importance of the sales held in them in a way fertilized as it were every kind of speculation rochefort whose passion for bric-a-brac took him to the hotel duo almost daily has a good deal to say on this subject in his amusing book on auction sales in the celebrated parisian sale room a book by the way which is now almost out of print the witty frenchman deals at length with the odd characters and silent speculations that have all unnoticed and unmolested grafted themselves upon the popular institution of the rue duo and other auction sale rooms as for the types of frequenters they are of all kinds and the most nondescript character first comes the collector in all his most interesting and amusing personifications Rochefort divides the amateurs hanging about auction rooms into three distinct classes, which he subdivides into genres and sous-genres, to use the writer's own terms. According to Rochefort's classification, the first class consists, broadly speaking, of persons who pay more for an object than it is worth, the second is composed of collectors who generally buy a thing for what it is worth, the third and last comprises those who pay less for a thing than it is worth rochefort aptly observes that the three divisions resemble the classes of a school the students passing from the lowest to each of the more advanced classes the collectors of the first group all freshmen without exception are separated by rochefort into sincere art lovers and mere poseurs speaking of the sincerity of collectors and premising that sincerity does not always imply an intelligent knowledge of art rochefort wittily remarks there are people who with the greatest self-confidence buy a daub for a titian suffice it to say adds the writer that at the sale of monsieur patrero's collection a virgin of the flemish school possibly an ecoute or a guver flink was sold a murillo at the price of forty five thousand five hundred francs in this foolish acquisition insincerity is out of the question Puzzers, snobs and the like rarely carry their foppishly garbed insincerities to the length of paying such high prices for mere parade in reference to real connoisseurs 
to quote Rochefort again, who was certainly most well informed on the subject, he says that they are so rare that it is scarcely worth while to speak of them. The most genuine living exponent of the species is already a fake among faking, becoming, namely, the owner of expensive curios not for art's sake, but chiefly in order to be able to ask his friends, by the way, have you seen my collection, or the last masterpiece I have bought, etc. The poseur, however, in his flippant and manifold attitudes, may be certain that schemes of deception are multiform and always a match for any incarnation of this type. He is the prey, and there are all kinds of snares waiting for him, just as there are many ways of catching birds. A collector who does not belong to the general class of collectors is the private dealer, who all too often joins force with the black band of the sale room. Among the buyers at the Hotel Duo, there are to be found, says Rochefort, all manner of originals. Take, for instance, the maquilleur, who is a regular godsend to restorers of paintings. The maquilleur is a purchaser of paintings who can never bring himself to leave a canvas in the state he bought it. If it is the portrait of an old woman, he is sure to take the work to a restorer to see if the wrinkles can possibly be smoothed out. If it is a landscape, he invariably has changes to suggest. When the canvas has been truly maquillé, he often takes it back to the auction room to try his chances with some novice. By the side of this character is the cleaner, the man who insists upon cleaning every painting that falls into his hands. On coming into possession, the work may be as bright and fresh as the varnish of a newly painted motor car. It makes no difference, he will clean it all the same. Cleaning spells death to pictures, just as spinach spells death to butter, wisely says the French writer in conclusion, laying down a humorous aphorism implying that to clean paintings practically means to ruin them. The very antithesis of the cleaner is the defiler of pictures, diametrically opposed to the former who worships soap, dye and other cleaning materials, he no sooner becomes the owner of a painting than he proceeds, as he says, to confer the proper age upon the work by a coat of dirt, the would-be patterner of age, which he ennobles and honours with various names, harmonising, toning, etc. Curious as it may sound, from among all the queer legion of auction room questionables, this member is less dangerous to art than many others, especially his pendant, the cleaner. This is readily understood when one considers that a skilled hand may remove any artificial patina, which is frequently separated from the pigment of the painting by a hard layer of old varnish, without any serious damage to the work of art while the cleaning of an old painting proves more or less ruinous to its artistic qualities. In fact, the use of strong chemical means either to remove aged dirt or centennial varnish brings away some of the colour as well. The damage done by cleaning with spirits or other strong methods is exceedingly great to some of the Dutch paintings, finished to a great extent by veiling with delicate layers of transparent pigment diluted in varnish. Venetian works, the colours of which do not always withstand the dissolvent properties of reagent, suffer irreparably from cleaning. According to the author of Les Petits Mystères de l'Hôtel des Vents, it is by no means impossible that the manipulations of these two art fiends may bring it about that a work be bought and cleaned by the cleaner, then put on sale again and bought by a defiler, to reappear at the auction room covered with fresh but soiled and old-looking patina. These two characters, like the maquilleur, are chiefly hobbyists and rarely associate. There are other oddities such as restorers, providers of documents, simple intriguers and unscrupulous businessmen who club together. One of their common schemes is to create pseudo-collections, supposed to have belonged to some noted person. Such collections are often composed only a few days before the auction sale and labelled as the property of Comte X or Baron D or styled anonymously as being belonged to a well-known collector or more often uncompromising initials designate the pseudo-owner of the work of art put up to auction. 
the profits to be gained in commending one's own goods and running down those in competition with them is accountable for other strange professions that flourish in the stuffy atmosphere of auction rooms the competition between genuine collections belonging to genuine collectors and these faked ones impels the schemer to extol the importance of the latter which has doubled and disciplines the activities of many strange helpers and queer professions one of the most important personages of this unnumbered company of frauds is the errantier he is as the french word indicates a man whose part in the business is to hang about auction rooms and run down works from which he has nothing to gain or impersonating the character of a disinterested outsider to praise works the sale of which will bring him profit whether directly or indirectly this defamer or praiser of works of art according to orders puts himself in the way of possible clients makes their acquaintance and cleverly manages to influence their opinion as though incidentally he may pass himself off as a simple art lover a dealer or any other suitable character it must be added that the errantaire is not always so venal as to sell his praises or defamation he is not always what might be called professional there exist a number of people who slander merely for its own sake urged either by jealousy evil disposition or a tendency to gossip at important auction sales this over courteous personage is far more dangerous than the man who does his work systematically and as a profession likely to be spotted by the public one of these art slanderers came very near inflicting a deadly blow to the successful sale of a donatello bronze put up to auction in london at a well-known art sale room on the day the objects were on view the work which by the way belonged to an italian antiquary who enjoys the reputation of being one of the best of connoisseurs was much admired by english art lovers and possible buyers a french art writer and connoisseur posed before the bronze and remarked that it was a clever fake possibly an imitation of the eighteenth century the comment passed from mouth to mouth and as the french critic was known to understand the italian renaissance those present expressed doubt as to its authenticity to counteract this unexpected check the antiquary hurriedly threw himself into a cab and visited the most serious frequenters of the auction room during the few hours preceding the sale and thus had time to convince them a new atmosphere soon prevailed and the donatello reached the record price of six thousand pounds it was afterwards discovered that the french critic had had a quarrel with the italian antiquary hence the spiteful comment some of these misrepresenters are not content with going about the sale room in search of opportunities to injure by running down a work or praising rubbish to the disadvantage of good things they pass judgment favourable or the reverse at the very moment a certain object is offered for sale an act which strictly speaking is against the law but the hidden practices of auction room intriguers are more or less baffling to protective laws like all the worthy members of the black band whose chief purpose in attending auction sales is to promote what is called the knockout this is a scheme of combining forces to hamper the natural course of bidding and to oblige the unwary to renounce competition or to pay an exaggerated price in its simplest and most schematic form the knockout works as follows a certain number of dealers go-betweens or other promiscuous plotters band together in a secret society for the purpose of discouraging buyers not belonging to their set though secret because of the law the society is in fact notorious among many of the regular frequenters of auction rooms as being both imperious and obnoxious this is not only carried on in paris but in other cities too where auction sale parasites manage to evade regulations and escape the vigilant eye of the law by this system the way is opened to any member of the society to cure an outsider of ambition or hope to buy advantageously at a sale if x a newcomer offers for some object its value or even a trifle more he will nevertheless lose the object or be forced to bid to a foolish figure as one of the conspirators will bid against him and if he happens to be obstinate he will pay dearly but if by mischance the object is left to his opponent after the fever of bidding has inflated the price the society makes good the loss sustained by its member 
dividing the money losses among the members of the society considerably lessens the loss of the bidder who has run the price up to an extravagant figure in order to punish someone they consider an invader the divisions of damages is generally effected as follows after the sale all the objects bought by the partners are put up to auction a second time among the members of the society at this second sale the goods are likely to be disposed of at their real commercial value if as is sometimes the case the total returns of this second sale are inferior to those of the auction room the difference paid to keep in force the rule of punishing is jointly borne by the co-operators and thus the cost of this chastisement game amounts to a small tax that each member of the black band very willingly pays the black band as it is called in paris is so powerful that many not belonging to the society often consent to deal with the members sometimes they ask one of them to buy on their behalf there may of course be a trifling commission to pay a certain percentage but in the end it comes considerably cheaper such transactions are naturally against the disposition of the laws on auction sales and are invariably made without the consent or knowledge of the directors of the sale room and it must be understood that if discovered there may be repression and an unexpected and brusque recall to the strict observance of the law here the fluctuating success of such societies which however notwithstanding the trammels of regulations appear to prosper one way of faking reputations as it might be called by which an object is sold at a higher price than it would reach under ordinary conditions is to list it in the catalogue of a forthcoming sale of some noted collection the faked reputation here consists in the fact that the name and reputation of the collector who had formed the collection bestows lustre upon the object inserted in the sale this illegal proceeding which well-known and reputable sale rooms will not countenance has occasioned endless lawsuits with the usual uncertain results as the illegitimacy of the object is not always easy to prove another method of faking the reputation of a certain work of art is the following suppose a dealer possesses a very mediocre picture of little value and wishes to have documentary proof that the work has cost him a good price instead of a low sum he has only to send the painting to the auction room and ask his comrades to run the bidding up to a certain figure then by buying in his own property and paying the percentage due to the auctioneer he withdraws the picture with the receipt the document he desired by this trick when the opportunity presents itself to sell the work he is able to produce what looks like a convincing proof of his honesty and square dealing you see sir i am going to be very candid and sincere with you here let me show you what i myself paid for this painting he will say and show the receipt of the public auction sale not infrequently the responsibility of the attribution is left to the owner of the work of art by which means objets d'art are often christened with names of a most fantastic paternity this is easily done take for instance a canvas that might or might not be righteously baptized school of leonardo the work is presented by the owner to be sold by auction and declared as a leonardo da vinci and in the catalogue it will naturally be put down to leonardo when the owner goes to buy in his own canvas he has of course no interest to run the price up to a fancy figure his sole aim is to be able to show to some future buyer a catalogue with the attribution printed and curiously enough printed attributions would appear to carry undisputed weight it is nevertheless a bait only for greenhorns with whom its effect rarely fails to prevent objects put up to auction from being knocked down at an unreasonably low figure it is an accepted system to place a reserve price upon them to write down when consigning the goods namely a certain price representing the lowest figure at which the object may be sold the auctioneer keeps this price in pictore on his private list that is to say when the article is put up for sale it is either offered straight away for the price quoted or the latter is led up to by by-bidding if this proves to be impossible the object is bought in and the owner has merely a percentage to pay on the last bid and can withdraw his property thus while an auction sale always presents hazards the reserve price is a guarantee against the risks of flagging moments 
the room may chance to be deserted of its best public through unforeseen circumstances enthusiasm may suddenly cool unaccountably and for these and other reasons a reserve price is therefore a legitimate defence strange to say even this honest and recognised safeguard has been turned to cunning abuse the principle of the reserve price at least has brought into being that questionable personage nicknamed in english auction rooms peter funk a most undesirable faker of situations the fact that the reserve price given to the auctioneer is often disclosed to interested collectors and that it may be divulged by auction room clerks and so become known induced collectors with objets de vertu on sale to send friends or agents secretly in order to run up the bidding to a certain figure the name long since given to this complacent secret partner shamming the art buyer is peter funk funkism if one may be allowed to coin a neologism certainly has its right to existence and originated in the legitimate desire to protect objects from falling at ridiculous prices in depressed moments of the sale but it has now become a regular curse especially at first-class auctions where by reason of the great interest at stake the system can be worked to its full magnitude and no expense spared as an example and one that to our knowledge worked greatly to the advantage of the seller and not at all to that of the buyer from whom funkism robs all chance of the fair play which should be the dominant note in auctions we may quote the sale of an italian collection at christie's at which certainly without the knowledge or even suspicion of the auctioneers peter funk played havoc under every form and guise to make sure that the keen-eyed collectors should not discover the pseudo-collectors the latter were all imported from the continent and given strict injunctions to buy at the stated price to bid without comment and to indulge in none but commonplaces in conversation with the public the dealer employing them knowing how impossible it is for a non-collector or a feigned art lover to say three words about a work of art without giving himself away a good appearance natural bidding without emphasis or theatrical pose an occasional yes or maybe or hem when questioned and a whole string of uncompromising banalities these are the stock in trade of an improvised peter funk who may not be so capable as the professional one but has the advantage of being less easily detected a clever peter funk knows the right moment to run up a price judging from his competitor's enthusiasm up to what sum he can safely bid before abandoning the game and by counting on his opponent's rashness and impulsiveness runs him up to bids which he afterwards regrets risky as it is rarely does an object remain in the hands of peter funk and if it does the owner will supply him with the money and withdraw the article paying the auctioneer's dues a comparatively modest percentage these combined forces in the auction room secretly working as a sequence of traps caused a well-known french collector to propose an inscription to be put over the door of one of these dangerous dens ici il y a des pièges à lui. It is not meant by this that all auction rooms are infested by brigands who leave no chance for fair play and that all who ever enter them come out regretting the attempts to buy at a system that appeals to the public for its square dealing not at all the best artistic investments are often made at public sales but rarely alas by the inexperienced novice who has but a limited knowledge of art and is besides wholly unfamiliar with the way of the auction rooms this double form of ignorance needs the warning that there are traps so that coolness and wisdom may enter the brain of the enthusiastic beginner two necessary items in gaining experience at a reasonable price end of chapter eighteen and part two Chapter 19 of The Gentle Art of Faking by Ricardo Nobili. The Sleep of Ox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. Part 3 The Faked Article. Chapter 19 The Makeup of Faked Antiques. Paintings, drawings, etchings, etc. How the art of faking necessarily borrows techniques and experience from the restorer. 
old and modern ways of imitating the technique of painting. New pictures on old canvases and old paintings repainted and doctored. Suggestions for imitating the preparation of panel or canvas. Imitating characteristic paintings in impasto. Veiling and varnishing. Imitating the cracking of varnish. Old drawings. Technique of the proper abuse to give an appearance of age to drawings. Etchings. Fresh margins to old prints, etc. Opinions as to the restoration of objects of art are of a most varied character, more especially in the case of painting, an art of rather complex technique. The various opinions about the restoration of paintings may, however, be classified into three distinct categories. One might be said to be entirely in favour of the process, one entirely discountenancing it, and between them one which is permissible as it has to do only with mechanical methods calculated to reinforce pigment, or the canvas or panel, and is not concerned with what might be called the artistic side of the art, such as retouching or filling in the missing parts of a painting. Speaking of certain restorations of his time, even Vasari remarks in the life of Luca Signorelli, that it would be far better for a masterpiece to remain ruined by time than to have it ruined by retouching by an inferior hand. Baldinucci tells us how Guido Reni objected to the retouching of old paintings, more especially the work of good masters, and that he invariably refused to do it himself, no matter how much a client was disposed to offer for the work. Milizia, the architect and writer, says that to retouch an old painting, particularly a fine work of art, is to pave the way for future and wider destruction, as in the course of time the retouching will show itself and then another act of barbarity will have to be perpetrated. According to the opinion of a well-known Florentine antiquary and famous restorer of paintings for the American market, a picture has nothing to gain from the hand of the restorer. On the contrary, his opinion is that, as soon as a restorer lay hands on a painting, he ruins it. The class we have placed between the two extremes, the one using a certain discrimination, accepting such methods as are intended merely to preserve the work without encroaching upon its artistic merits, such as furnishing a fresh panel or canvas to a painting, removing old and deteriorated varnish, etc., being the wise one is, of course, represented by the minority. Needless to say, the main forces of the class supporting restoration in its extreme form are drawn from the ranks of restorers or authors of works teaching the grand art of resuscitating masterpieces, such men as Mérimé, Vergniaud, Prang, Déon, Forni and Seco Suado. The latter, in fact, does not hesitate to call restoration a magic art and depicts the restorer as a regular miracle worker. We do not propose in this chapter to follow the various methods of restoring paintings according to the character of the work, fresco, tempera or oil, but simply to indicate some of the restoration processes that are useful to fakers in deceiving inexperienced collectors. In the case of faking up an old painting of weak or defective character into the delusive suggestion of a work of good quality, the process consists principally of bringing the form into proper shape by veiling and toning the crude parts of the colouring. This work, the success of which chiefly depends upon the skill and versatility of the forger, is generally effected by first removing the old varnish with a solvent. There are many kinds of solvents which can be used, according to the quality of the varnish. The most common, however, is alcohol. It must be very pure, containing the minimum of water. Ordinary alcohol is likely to produce opaque white patches, a phenomenon called by the French restorer chancy, and very difficult to obliterate once it has appeared. Being one of the strongest solvents, and of dangerous and too rapid action at times, the alcohol is generally mixed with turpentine in the proportion of half and half to start with. Then, according to the greater or lesser solubility of the varnish, the proportion of alcohol is gradually increased. This mixture, called la mista by Italian antiquaries, may be substituted, as we have said, by various solvents, potash, soda, ammonia, etc., according to the nature or hardness of the varnish to be dissolved. Some restorers also resort to mechanical methods to remove old varnish. These methods, too, are various. If the varnish is hard, it can be cracked by pressure from the thumb, a long operation requiring no small amount of patience and skill. 
if it possesses sufficient elasticity to withstand this process, it is generally removed with a steel blade in the form of an eraser. The latter operation is not only very difficult but very slow, particularly when the painting possesses artistic qualities that must not be impaired by the removal of the varnish. This first operation successfully accomplished, the artist steps in and proceeds to help the work, say of such and such a school, to resemble the painting of the master of this school as much as possible. The process is naturally executed by the aid of a more or less complete collection of photographs of the work of the master the faker intends to imitate. The retouching may follow the most varied methods. To take the most common case, that of oil painting, the new work can be carried out with oil colours previously kept on blotting paper to drain off the oil which is then substituted with turpentine to give the colours their lost fluidity. It may also be affected with tempera colours or with colours the fluid element of which consists only of varnish. The use of tempera is preferred by restorers because, although it presents the extreme difficulty of changing hue when varnished, and consequently demands no little experience to judge the requisite hue or tone, still once laid down it is not likely to change with time as oil retouching on old paintings generally does. The mixing of colour with varnish alone has the advantage of keeping the proper tone from beginning to end. This method is extremely useful, not only in the painting of missing parts, but also to veil and tone what has been painted in tempera, if this is not entirely harmonious with the rest after varnishing. Needless to add, those colours, the fluid part of which is supplied by varnish, are unalterable, as they do not contain any oil whatever. One of the difficulties in handling these pigments is the lack of fluidity, hence turpentine may be added with advantage. However, as the above methods of retouching are not proof against chemical tests, alcohol being the proper solvent with which to do away with added touches to old paintings which have been done with either oil or varnish colours, the shrewder fakers either mix amber varnish with the colours or give the fresh touches a solid coating of this varnish, which when well prepared is supposed to be insoluble and not easily acted upon by solvents. Although more than one special work on the art of restoring gives recipes for the preparation of this varnish, in practice very few know how to prepare it in the proper way. We have here presupposed that the picture was in good order, that there were no missing parts of importance, or rather that, with panel or canvas unimpaired, the work only required to be retouched by the artist, a rare case, as when the paint has vanished, the preparation of the panel or canvas has generally vanished with it, on account of its adhesiveness. We do not propose to give the various recipes for the plaster dressing forming the preparation of the panel or canvas. They are different according to time and country and can be found in special works on painting. Under ordinary conditions it is very easy to substitute the missing preparation, just as it is easy to give it the proper surface either by pumice or skilled coating with the brush. But in the case of a painting on canvas it is very seldom that there are not big holes right through it. The first operation in such cases is to re-canvas the work, to line it, namely, with another canvas, which is pasted to the old one and flattened with an iron till perfectly dry. The missing part must then be filled in, imitating the weave of the canvas on which the work is painted. No easy matter this, as the different weaves of canvases are as characteristic as signatures, no two are ever alike. The new canvas showing through the hole is therefore either covered with a patch of canvas taken from some corner of the painting to be restored, or it is given the same appearance by pressing a piece of the old canvas upon the fresh preparation of the part missing, thus moulding the texture of the threads. This must be done skilfully in such a way that the parallel lines of the threads match. There are some clever fakers who imitate the old canvas by strokes of a hard brush upon the fresh preparation of the new pieces, reproducing the characteristics of the canvas by actually copying from the original parts. When a painting is finished, there are various methods by which an appearance of age may be given or restored to it. From asphalt to licorice, hundreds of things are used, either dissolved in turpentine or water, glue, albumen, etc. Veiling with varnish, coloured with the proper pigment, generally gives the finishing touch. The imitation of old and cracked varnish is simple enough. First, one must give the canvas a coat of diluted glue, then varnish before the glue is quite dry. 
as the under layer of glue dries quickly and has a shrinking capacity disproportionate to that of the varnish it is easy to understand that the result will be a cracking of the varnish a closer or coarse network of cracks is obtained by increasing or decreasing the inequality of shrinkage between the two layers or by hastening or retarding the drying of the upper layer by artificial means although comparatively easy these operations nevertheless demand no little experience to be crowned with due success if a painting has been repainted only in the parts that were missing and the old varnish has not been removed from the rest of the picture it is a question of not only giving the varnish of the new spots cracks like the old varnish but these must imitate as closely as possible those of the original part of the painting in such cases a needle is used to make the cracks on the newly varnished parts when the grooves have been made in the varnish they are filled in with water and colour or soot to give them the desired appearance of age such roughly is the method mostly in use for oil paintings with the necessary variations and the use of the proper medium the same method also answers for tempera it is rare that frescoes are imitated or retouched but in such cases fresh cheese is used as the vehicle for the colour and when dry it not only acquires the quality of insolubility but also the opaque hue of the fresco as far as technique is concerned the imitator does not find it easy to imitate the work of those artists who paint in impasto that is to say with a thick layer of pigment the consequent characteristic strokes of the brush requiring no little experience for reproduction in all their force character and characteristics through long study and practice some finally succeeded in imitating the works of such painters as rembrandt or franz hals but such cases are extremely rare Forney, who has written a work on the restoration of paintings, suggests a method of imitating impasto painting with its characteristic brushstrokes which, in our view, can only be applied in the case of repairing a part missing in some old painting. Forney's method consists of first reproducing the peculiarities of the brushstroke in a plaster composition, closely resembling that of the preparation of the canvas, and then giving the proper colouring according to forney this method has the advantage of giving the impression of a frank and vigorous style of painting such as is usual with the impasto technique yet it has been achieved slowly and patiently one of the side businesses of picture faking is the providing of suitable signatures when one considers that paintings generally bear the artist's signature more especially in recent times it would be strange if this branch of the shady trade did not number specialists who can imitate signatures to perfection as well as reproduce artists special monograms it is easy to understand how old drawings and sketches may be imitated just as in the case of faking a painting the artist tries first to become familiar with the work he wishes to imitate it is then usually executed on old paper and when finished soaked in dirty water dried and scoured with pumice to give it the apparent abuse of age some imitators however do not give themselves the trouble to find the proper paper and it is not unusual to see imitations on modern paper or would-be sixteenth century work on paper bearing the mill mark of two or three centuries later but these of course are the gross imitations only intended to dupe the most naive of beginners prints are also imitated and nowadays to perfection with the help of mechanical aids when they have to reproduce an excellent original the aging process is the same as that used for drawings there is one difference between them to be noted it is that in the case of old prints or etchings the presence or absence of the margin counts for much an etching with its original paper margin is far more valuable than one that has been cut to fit a frame or for any other purpose hence one particular branch of faking of prints is to refurnish paper margins to those specimens that have lost them the work is more or less successful according to the skill of the faker but is usually effected in the following manner the etching is cut all round the edge reasonably near the printed part then a large piece of old paper is cut to fit the etching as a frame and the two edges are brought and held together for some time by a paper lining at the back the crack of the join between the old etching and the new margin is filled in with paste of the same composition as the paper and smoothed even by a mechanical process it is of course needless to add that such a method is not likely to take in a true collector but the faker knows that foolish clients are sometimes numerous and his best supporters miniature work is easy to imitate not only on account of its technique 
in which originality has a comparatively small role to play, but because it needs hardly any patina or ageing. Pastels and watercolours, more especially the latter, appear to be a little out of the forger's line, yet pastel, with its peculiar technique, affords possibilities for faking. Copies of noted originals have not escaped the speculative spirit of the counterfeiter. They are generally sold as contemporary copies or antique copies, and they seem to command higher prices, even if an old copy is at times far inferior to a modern one. In the faking of modern or semi-modern art, the technique intended to confer age and venerability to the work finds no place. In such cases it is easy to understand, the main craft lies in imitating the style of the master counterfeited. Speaking of such imitations, we may note that fakers contemporary with the artist are perhaps the most dangerous to the neophyte, as imitations have always existed more or less, and are by no means only the product of greed of modern fakers and dealers. A collector is often taken in by a false coral, or a false rousseau, in which the only legitimate thing is perhaps the date, the forgery having been perpetrated during the master's timeline. Naturally, the imitation is not always made for the purpose of cheating, but almost always with the hope of becoming as popular as a certain master by imitating his style. It is very often the work of pupils, as in the case of the Watteau imitations by Lancre and Pater. It is known that the work of Paul Potter has been imitated by Klump, that Jacob van Housum has been counterfeited by the works of Bruegel and Vowermans, that Constantine Netscher made plenty of money copying Van Dyck Charles I portraits, and that Tenier the Younger sold false Titians. To go back to prints and etchings before closing this chapter, one must make a distinction between old imitations and modern ones. A good connoisseur is never at a loss to detect signs of counterfeit, but there is an essential difference of criterion needed in judging old imitations of etchings and modern imitations. In old prints, involuntary discrepancies are sure to occur as they have been reproduced by hand, and the connoisseur must therefore be acquainted with them. These variations are more or less known to experts, whereas in the case of a modern purely mechanical reproduction, a magnifying glass and technical experience are the chief requirements. Marco Dente's reproduction of Marc Antonio's work and the copies of Callot's etchings by some of his pupils are examples of the imperfections of old imitations, details having been omitted. End of chapter 19. Chapter 20 of The Gentle Art of Faking by Ricardo Nobili. The Sleeperbox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. Chapter 20. Faked Sculpture, Bas Reliefs and Bronzes. Faked Sculpture. Clay Work. The False Tanagras. Imitation of Renaissance Work. Bas Reliefs and Busts. Baked Clay and Stucco Duro. The Claudians. Bronzes. The Importance of Patina. The Patina of Pompeian Bronzes and Excavated Bronzes. Renaissance patina and that of later times, gilded bronzes, marble work and its general colouring, sculpture in wood and ivory, the cheroplastica. We must repeat that in sculpture also, faking borrows largely from the art of restoring. Indeed, it is no exaggeration to say that nearly all branches of the faker's art turn for help to the restorer's methods. And here again, as in painting, we are also immediately confronted by two forms of trickery. One is the creation of a modern object in imitation of the antique so as to deceive the collector, and the other the reconstruction of some fantastic piece of forgery from an inferior object, or one greatly damaged by over-restoration. To speak of over-restoration is in such cases to use a euphemism. We can offer an example showing how this over-restoration of objects is nothing but a form of faking highly flavoured with different varieties of deception. A rich American bought a marble statue some years ago representing a famous Roman empress. It was bought not only because the Roman art appealed to him, but as the portrait of that particular Roman empress. As a matter of fact, the whole statue had been faked by the addition of new portions to a headless, limbless torso, which was the only genuinely antique part. 
We must say, however, that the new head given to the half-faked statue was extremely well done. It had been copied from a well-known model, and except that the patina of the marble was not so perfect as might have been expected from a great master in trickery, the most experienced collector might have been deceived. Clay work is perhaps the most popular form of plastic art among the fakers of antiques. As it has the special advantage of being made from casts of originals, it does not present any real technical difficulty, and demands no expensive additions, and may be given colour and patina with comparative ease. Of course, many of these advantages are also shared by bronzes, stucco, and all productions worked from an original model in clay or any other plastic substance, such as wax, pastiline, etc. Tanagra figurines undoubtedly hold the first place in the large class of faked clay work. There has been an uninterrupted succession of forges in this line from the time Tanagra work first came into fashion with collectors, to the stock imitations now sold in Paris and still bought for genuine Tanagras by over-naive collectors. The old Baron Rothschild, who had a fine collection of Tanagra figurines, and no small experience as a connoisseur, used to say that when it is a question of a Tanagra one must see it excavated, and even that nowadays is hardly a guarantee of genuineness. The imitations are generally cast from good originals, and as the clay shrinks considerably in drying and baking, the imitation is usually smaller than the original and can therefore easily be detected when confronted with a genuine piece. Some of the more advanced imitators have somewhat obviated this difference of dimension by mechanical methods of expanding moulds, but the work in such cases is not so perfect as otherwise, and what is gained on the one hand, namely a dimension identical to that of the original, is lost on the other, as methods of taking oversized moulds from the original are generally imperfect. A flourishing product of the Italian market are bas-reliefs and clay busts in imitation of Renaissance work. When not the work of clever artists who model directly from the clay, having studied and mastered the old style, it is the product of miserable mechanical deception, aided by ability to disguise its patchwork nature, the trickery and general sleight of hand of the wily art of faking. In the case of bas-reliefs, they are often composed of different parts belonging to different originals, sometimes originals unknown to connoisseurs and art critics. This method has been applied to the imitation of Renaissance terracotta busts. A bust bought a high figure from a Venetian antiquary many years ago and believed to be a genuine Quattrocento work was afterwards discovered to have been made from the cast taken from the face of a recumbent figure on a tomb in the church of San Pietro e Paolo to which had been added the back part of another bust, the whole finally set upon a pair of shoulders cast from another original of the period. The monument from which the face had been moulded was so high up on the wall of the church of San Pietro e Paolo that no one knew of the existence of this original, and the other parts of the faked object had also been taken from little-known originals. The fraud was discovered in Paris some time after the bust had entered a noted collector. A lawsuit ensued, and the collector eventually recovered the money he had paid. Italian art of the 15th century has produced many clay bas-reliefs, apparently from one and the same original, and yet presenting slight differences, additions and modifications, evidently made after the clay had left the mould, but when it was still fresh. This fact has greatly incited the fancy of Italian forgers and largely contributed to the confusion of art critics and the duping of more than one collector. These bas-reliefs represent sacred subjects for the most part, and sometimes it is not merely a question of putting a rose in the Madonna's hand or a little bird into those of the infant Jesus in order to lay claim to due originality, but the modifications are so radical that the whole appearance of the work is changed. It is generally done as follows. A good plaster mould is made from a good original, and a clay reproduction formed from this mould, which is then modified and changed while still fresh. Should the work to be divested of its original character represent, say, a Madonna and child, the artist may proceed to alter its size by modifying the border. Then, to transform the subject, he may make an addition to one side, of the heads of the ox and ass, taken, of course, from another original. To change the pose of the Madonna, the clay is generally cut behind the head and neck with a fine wire, and then the position of the head can be altered at pleasure, from being erect, for instance, it can be inclined, or vice versa. 
By the same method, and no small amount of skill, arms and hands can be given new attitudes, etc. The final result is a work which passes as an original among foolish art lovers who collect series. Stucco duro imitations are produced by almost identical methods. These compositions are generally made of plaster, which hardens as it dries after being poured into a mould. When the original is to be modified, a first model of clay or some other soft modelling material is indispensable, of course, and from this mould it is then taken for the casting of the stucco duro. To colour and give a patina either to baked clay or stucco is comparatively easy. The colouring is given with tempera colours, the patina with tinted water, for which tobacco, soot, etc. may be used, applied with smoky and greasy hands. A coat of benzene in which a small quantity of wax has been dissolved is finally laid on with a brush and the whole polished with a brush or wool. As we have said, however, fakers are especially partial to clay work. It requires little outlay, the finished work can be fired at small expense, the colouring and patina can be given at home, not needing the special lights of a studio, etc. Not only in the case of Renaissance work has this method been the favoured one, but in other types of art forgery, the 18th century terracottas, for instance, the lovely work of Claudian, Falconet, Marin, etc., Paris is glutted with imitations of Claudian's clay groups. Some of them are sufficiently good to puzzle the best connoisseurs. As we have seen, a pseudo-Claudian sold years ago in perfectly good faith by Monsieur du Boulet to Madame Bois caused a complicated lawsuit and many inconclusive discussions among art critics and connoisseurs of the calibre of Eugène Gulliam, Chapou, Millet, Claire Bellus and specialists on Claudian's work, such as Theocor. It was finally established that the bit bearing Claudian's name was authentic and had been inset in a group of much later date, a spurious original, but even this was not absolutely proved and simply offered as the most accepted hypothesis. As Paul Eudel remarks, to decide the matter, Claudian would have to raise the stone of his sepulchre and to rise from his tomb in order to supply an irrefutable solution. The initial process of faking antique bronzes is very similar to that used in clay and stucco forgeries. By initial process we mean, of course, the way the mould is made for casting the bronze. When the pseudo-original has been modelled in clay, the form of it is naturally taken to obtain a matrix of some harder material, and from this matrix is taken the mould that is used for the cast. There is also another system of casting bronzes generally in vogue among fakers, more especially for small objects, which is known as cire perdu. It is a simplified method, consisting of modelling the object in wax, then taking its mould, which is emptied by melting the wax. The details of the two methods of casting bronze, the ordinary casting and the cire perdu process, can be found in any technical work on bronze casting and need not be repeated here. The patina of bronzes presents a difficulty in addition to the artistic difficulties of creating a convincing pseudo-original, difficulties common to clay, stucco and in fact all faked sculpture. Patina, the Nobilis Irugo of Horace, is the peculiar oxidisation acquired by bronze with age. For the connoisseur, the patina is not only a part of the artistic tout ensemble of a bronze object, so much so that there are collectors more impressed by the beauty of the patina than by the artistic value of the piece, but it is the chief indication of the authenticity of the work. According to Pliny, great importance was attached to the Nobilis Irugo by the Roman connoisseurs also, especially in the case of the famous Corinthian bronze. This metal was classified into five qualities by the Roman amateur according to five different hues or patinas depending on the proportion of gold and silver in the alloy. Roman art lovers made a regular study of bronze patina and of the composition of the bronze of art objects. The components of this knowledge were not only gathered from the appearance of a certain bronze but by its relative weight and the odour of the metal. That the odour of an alloy should have been made a test to judge of its component parts is very possible as the smell of bronze and brass is essentially different, and there is no reason why a practised Roman nose should not have distinguished slight differences according to the proportion of the various metals in the alloy. 
One reason, apart from artistic motives, why the collector gives the patina so much consideration is, as we have said, because the patina nowadays is one of the safest guides in buying antique bronzes. Whilst the artistic qualities of certain objects may be reproduced with skill or trickery, patina of a really genuine and entirely convincing appearance is supposed to be beyond the faker's art. Our own and other people's experience leads us to doubt this, but such, as a matter of fact, is the common belief among collectors. Faked patina, it is true, is less transparent and duller than the genuine, and can easily be detected by shininess at points and sharp edges of a bronze where it is difficult to fix the imitation patina. But, we would repeat, there are bronzes in Naples and some of the cities of northern Italy that have deceived the best connoisseurs, and samples may be seen in nearly all the important museums of Europe and America. Almost all works treated specially of metal casting give various methods of obtaining a proper patina according to the different hues one may wish to give the bronze. Yet modern methods of colouring and oxidising bronze do not seem to satisfy the antiquary, and, in consequence, the faker of antique bronzes. All modern mechanical methods produce fine colouring without brilliancy, colouring that does not seem to possess the vibrant quality of old patina, oxidation that appears to be too superficial to show the depth of colouring peculiar to patina obtained by the slow process of age. To obtain such an effect the faker resorts to the most varied and out-of-the-way methods and when possible tries to hasten the slow oxidation of age by greasing and smoking the object, putting it in damp places and treating it with acids. Often the most varied methods are used in conjunction or alternatively with a patience and persistence worthy of a more honourable cause, but practised with ever greater keenness, alas, with the promise of much gain. Some of the most successful patterners are obtained not only by duly working at the colouring and oxidation of the metal, but by composing the alloy in such a way as to favour the production of a convincing patina later on. Naturally, the differences of the patina of old bronzes depend not only on the various conditions to which the work may have been exposed through age, but upon the colouring or kind of artificial oxidation that may have been given it upon leaving the foundry. Thus, whilst an antique bronze brought up from the bottom of the sea may have the peculiar patina of age acquired under these special conditions and another statue exposed only to the atmospheric oxidation may show the different hue belonging to the atmosphere of air there are bronzes which have been coloured upon leaving the foundry and even when age has given brilliance to the patina they bear the characteristics differentiating the school or artist the most difficult to imitate are the excavated Greek, Roman or Etruscan bronzes, especially when the humidity of the soil or some peculiar condition has produced a kind of patina possessing the appearance of enamel. Among the artificial hues of Renaissance bronze, the brownish tint of the Paduan school is characteristic, and worthy of note are some of the blackish specimens of Venetian bronze as well as the whole emporium of samples of the versatile Florentine school. Some of these patinae are reproduced fairly well, and now that Gian Bologna and his school are beginning to be appreciated, we would state that faking is successfully studied to produce the reddish patina of some of the not always exquisite, but yet invariably interesting little bronzes of Tacca Susini Francavia and others. It was once believed by some collectors that gilded bronzes could not be imitated, that the galvanoplastic method was as recognisable as any false and badly made coin. We doubt this, for we fail to see why the old system of gilding with mercury could not be applied to imitations. It is somewhat slower and more expensive, but the profit, as usual, makes it worthwhile in the eye of the faker. Gilding is certainly imitated to perfection on modern pieces purporting to be the work of French artists of the 18th century, and some of the counterfeits of Guterres's and Caffieri's work have even the varnish that was at one time considered inimitable. The great progress made in imitating patina has rendered the collecting of bronzes one of the most dangerous branches the collector can choose. In the case of marble, stone, or other hard materials that has to be chiselled, the faker generally starts his work along the lines of the sculptor, that is to say, he models the original in clay, casts it in plaster, and transfers it to the marble by the usual methods. 
then when this artistic part has been accomplished successfully the marble or stone must be given the appearance of antiquity and the patina belonging to age this is generally effected by two distinct operations one relating to the form the other to the colour and the whole peculiar harmonization of tone and polish called patina as regards the form modern sculpture being somewhat too precise and sharp edged the chief aim of the operation is to destroy these qualities as well as to confer upon the object the abuse that is supposed to be traced upon an antique during its long pilgrimage through the ages the marble is therefore skilfully chipped here and there with mallet and chisel sand and acid are applied to dull the oversharping tooling and sometimes to cause corrosion etc the principle accepted it is easy to understand that ways of aging sculpture are multiplied and vary according to the illusion the faker intends to convey the fact that old greek and roman work is not identical with renaissance productions in appearance as the former are generally excavated while the latter come down to us through a long succession of owners is sufficient to show that there are slight differences which must be taken into consideration for colouring marble and stone a general tone is usually given at first which is intended to destroy the crudeness of the new material especially in the case of marble one of the most common ways is to wash the object with water containing a certain quantity of green vitriol when applied before the stone has lost its permeability this solution penetrates deeply particularly in marble and the colouring is not easily destroyed or washed out by long exposure to atmospheric action some use nitrate of silver also when a different hue is to be given but the solution mentioned first which confers the proper ivory tone to the marble is the most common naturally a tone given by these means is too uniform and monotonous to be taken for the colouring of old age so the artist calls his talent and experience into play by producing the desired variation there is in fact no other teaching but experience and taste it is to be noted that in the colouring of stone and particularly marble the artist has an almost complete palette at his disposal for in this branch chemistry supplies nearly every hue possible we may remark by the way that the art of colouring marble was already well understood in the days of ancient greece and it is a fact that more than one statue of that period shows signs of colouring wonderfully preserved through the ages in italy where marble dyeing is still a flourishing art it is done with very few colours verdigris gamboge dragon's blood cochineal redwood and logwood nearly all vegetable dyes are suitable and many coal tar colours if properly used give a very fast and beautiful colour to marble it is essential for the solution of all dyes to be made with alcohol or ether and only such anilines may be employed as are soluble in fat some solutions may be applied direct to the marble whatever the temperature others require the heating of the marble to increase its permeability and consequent faculty of imbibing the colouring solution the quality and condition of the marble must also be taken into consideration if the marble has not been polished properly or has been touched with greasy hands a patchy effect or stains will result rubbing with flannel and the moderate use of encaustic gives the finishing touches when the character of the patina requires the shiny effect so often seen in old marbles objects sculptured in wood represent no change of technique for the forger of antiques as far as the carving is concerned the forger's ability to imitate the work of an old master is purely artistic and cannot of course be achieved by any special method but the art of giving the object a convincing appearance of age is fairly mechanical depending on the use of alkali permanganate of potash and other substances the process being somewhat complex and common as a matter of fact to all kinds of wood carving it will be given in detail when imitation antique furniture and the methods of producing it are described faked furniture being perhaps one of the most productive branches of the obscure trade of counterfeit antiques sometimes artistic figures or bas reliefs in wood are either coloured or gilded in the case of polychromatic work the wood is generally coated with a plaster preparation to receive the colour and the technique for ageing or giving a patina is that already described for stucco or clay work in the case of gilding the appearance of age is given to the new gold by colour veiling also licorice juice and burnt paper are used with advantage applied to the gold with a soft brush 
ivory work too, which represents one of the most dangerous fields to neophytic enterprise, requires no special technique in counterfeiting as far as the artistic creation is concerned. It must also be tempting to the carver as a material, for certain naive effects of primitive art seem aided by the essential qualities of the ivory, its fibrous constitution in particular. One may safely say that there is nowadays hardly a single genuine Byzantine Christ. There are, however, plenty on the market, of course. The old cracks of antique ivory are very easily imitated. There is more than one method for producing them. The most common is to plunge the piece in boiling water and then quickly dry before a fire. The operation can, of course, be repeated until the desired effect is attained. Here, also, smoke and tobacco juice can perform miracles. Sometimes ivory pieces are placed into a fermenting heap of fertiliser or wet hay. The methods are, in fact, most varied, and an inventive spirit seems of great assistance to the faker in devising new schemes every day. We now come to the last class of this chapter, seroplastics, which includes all forms of modelled wax, small bas reliefs, supposed to have been the originals of plaquettes, little family portraits in coloured wax, etc., in this branch, patina and complicated methods to attain an appearance of age hardly come into consideration. The mere touch of the hand is at times sufficient to stain the wax, and work of this kind takes the colouring so readily after it is modelled that no craft is needed in imitating old wax work, provided the artist is able to imitate the antique handiwork. Besides, wax portraits have been for the most part kept under glass and have come down to us fresh as though made yesterday not only those of a century or two ago, but also those that have reached a most respectable centennial age. Waxwork is one of the easiest to imitate, and one of the most difficult to detect when imitated. We are therefore inclined to advise the freshman collector to abstain from buying this kind of work, unless irrefutable documentary evidence is offered in the shape of a well-authenticated pedigree of the work. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of The Gentle Art of Faking by Ricardo Nobili. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. Chapter 21. Faked Pottery. Faked Pottery. Old, unglazed types. Artistic and scientific interest in pottery. Oriental glazed pottery. Greek and Etruscan half-glazed vases. Faience and its various types. Italian factories, Cafagiolo, Urbino, etc. Iridescent glazes, Hispano Moresque, De Ruta, and Gubbio. French pottery, faked palissy and imitations of Henry II. Other types of French faience. China, the old and modern composition of China. Various ways of faking China of good marks. Half faked pieces blunders in marks, glasses and enamels. Pottery presents one of the richest and most varied fields for imitation and faking. The endless types and specialities of this class seem to have spurred the versatile genius of the imitator. Broadly speaking, and age apart, pottery may be divided into two classes, one in which glazing does not appear, and one in which this important element of ceramics lends an entirely different character to the product. The first class more especially, if not exclusively, may be grouped into two types according to character, those that interest the scientist in particular, and those that come more into the domain of the artist and art lover. It is of course understood that there is no definite line of demarcation between the two. Faking, however, with a great spirit of impartiality, makes no distinctions and is ready to meet its clients on the scientific or artistic field, and fully prepared to accommodate the scientist with an artistic bent, or the artist possessing the learned propensities of the historian. Thus Mexican idols and Peruvian pottery, as well as the productions of savage tribes, are imitated and copied with the same interest as the unglazed vases of Samos, Greek clay urns and Roman lamps. What regulates the increase of the forger's activities and spurs his genius is, as we have said, the demand for an article and its price. 
There is nothing surprising then in the fact that some rather indifferent types of pottery of savage tribes or incomplete aboriginal specimens should have been faked as though they presented the interest of a chef d'oeuvre. Not altogether of this class, but certainly of limited interest so far as art is concerned, are the Mexican articles which have been among the most exploited by those who know that these kinds of relics are in great demand by scientists as well as collectors who have a passion for specialities. In the exhibition of 1878, a group of scientists put the incautious upon their guard by exhibiting a whole series of faked Mexican idols, pottery and so forth. But as the articles, especially at that time, were in great vogue, the warning was not sufficient for specialists and collectors, and the show of faked Mexican art proved such a success that it stirred the honesty or cynicism, we hardly know which, of a Parisian dealer who conceived the notion to advertise his wares, forgeries of Mexican idols, 5 to 25 francs. Unglazed Oriental and Greco-Roman pottery with its fine forms and decorative character has not only proved an attraction to the collector but is very tempting to the faker who finds no great difficulty in imitating it. The way to render such pottery antique looking is easy. Acids may play their part here too but they are hardly necessary as the porous nature of the clay makes it able to absorb any kind of hue, tone and dirt if buried in specially prepared ground or in a bed of fertiliser. Curiously enough, from one point of view, the imitation of this early art generally flourishes on the very spot where the originals are excavated, and still more odd is that on more than one occasion those duped were the very ones supposed to be good connoisseurs and who took direct interest in the excavations. Thus it is that there is an abundance of faked Samos, Rhodes and other specimens in collections now housed in museums. A superficial inspection of the Cesnola collection in the Metropolitan Museum of New York ought to be sufficient to prove that even connoisseurs as good as Cesnola are not quite safe in this speciality against the trickery of modern imitators. With Greek, companion or etruscan pottery that bears a peculiar polish or glazing the nature of which is still a mystery to ceramists the case is somewhat different good imitations are rare naturally there cannot be included among convincing imitations those upon which a lead glaze has been used as such imitations are covered with a thick layer of shining glaze and are only intended for various neophytes who have presumably never seen an original Successful imitations are either finished with a very thin and non-shining glaze or an encaustic polish. To ascertain whether encaustic has been used, one has only to rub the piece with a cloth soaked in benzene, which will soon turn it opaque. In the Pottery Museum of Sèvres, there is an interesting series of faked Greek and Etruscan vases, urns, etc. It comprises some good specimens of the work of Touchard, an imitator flourishing about the year 1835, other pieces by the Giustiniani of Naples, and some of the most successful fakes of this particular kind of pottery, the pieces by Krieg from the Rheinzebahn factory. These pieces were sold to the Sèvres Museum as genuine by a Bavarian in the year 1837. We are told that a good method in imitating Etruscan pottery is to work with engobe, adding a well-ground frit to the barbotine that contains the elements of a glaze. To our knowledge, all imitations of this kind are wanting in appearance and it is safe to assert that they could hardly receive serious consideration from a true connoisseur. As regards glazed oriental ceramics, there are to be noted some good imitations of Persian work and, above all, imitations of the characteristic pottery of Rhodes. Factories for these ceramics are almost everywhere. Perhaps the best imitations come from a factory in Paris. Imitations from this factory have succeeded in deceiving more than one connoisseur. A well-known curator of a Berlin museum bought one of these samples as genuine, paying £80 for it, and an antiquary in Florence, quite a specialist in ceramics, very nearly committed the same mistake, but by good luck he was warned by a friend who had been taught by hard experience that this oriental pottery is a product of very western origin. Curiously enough, the manufacturers do not sell their produce for anything but imitations. However, through the usual frauds in which the market in antiques abounds, these pieces are evidently palmed off on unwary collectors outside France. 
Oriental pottery is usually so well preserved, thanks to its hard glaze, that the faker is spared all complicated processes to give the piece an appearance of age. The glazed work of Hispano-Moresque pottery presents a more or less successful field to imitators. The lustrous glaze of various hues does not seem to offer difficulties to the modern ceramist, who has learned how to use the mysterious cooperation of smoke in the so-called muffle glaze. Yet when confronted with originals, which are becoming rarer and rarer in the market every day, the best of imitations leaves room for meditation as the genuine is usually a very uncomfortable neighbour to the counterfeit. The Italian Renaissance, with its various and interesting types, has yielded a fine crop of imitations. In fact, plagiarism was already rampant when the old factories, now extinct, were in full activity. Thus, on more than one occasion, Faenza has copied Cafagiolo, and the works of Urbino, Pizarro and Casteldurante are often interchanged, while the factories of Savona seem to have blended its unmistakable individuality with the models of all the most successful factories. Cafagiolo, Gubbio and Derutha are perhaps the types of old Italian pottery to which the faker has given preference. There are some modern imitations of Cafagiolo made by a ceramist of Florence so well done that they have deceived the very best connoisseurs of Paris and Berlin. But for the fact that we have pledged ourselves to point out the sins and not the sinners or their victims, we could enumerate a rather interesting list of illustrious victims to this clever imitator of Cafagiolo, who is still at work in Florence and more dangerous every day by reason of the perfecting of his deceitful art. There are also old imitations of Cafagiolo, made by the Sicilian factory of Caltagirone, and if only one thing surprises us more than another, it is that good collectors should buy this type freely as genuine. They are apparently blind to the grossness of the imitation, and above all to its dark, dirty blue, which has nothing in common with the beautiful colour of a genuine Cafagiolo. Another cherished type offering great enticement to the Italian faker, even though not imitated successfully enough to take in the real expert, is the work of De La Robbia. Imitations of this work, copies from good originals and honestly sold as such, are to be seen at one of the most important potteries in Florence, Cantigali, a firm of almost historical reputation. Being intended to be sold as reproductions, copies or imitations, no patina is given to these. It is not only in Italy that Italian films has been freely imitated, but also in other countries, particularly France. Among the successful imitators, we may quote Joseph Dever, who made such good imitations of Italian films that he had the honour to sell some of his specimens to the Sèvres Museum in 1851. Looking now at these imitations of Della Robbia, made so successfully by Dever in 1851, one wonders how they could have been taken for genuine by experienced connoisseurs. The lustre work of Maestro Giorgio Andrioli and De Rutha has been imitated by many factories, but notwithstanding the efforts put forth and the progress made in discovering the secrets of lustrous glazing, the imitations, especially of Maestro Giorgio, are deficient. In the Gubbio work of the best epoch, a special firing must have been used, especially for the red hue, which is so original and characteristic that it seems to defy imitation. That the Maestro Giorgio's must have been glazed at a low temperature, at any rate for the production of the iridescent effect of its colours, may be concluded from an incident that occurred in Gubbio years ago. On the spot where Maestro Giorgio is supposed to have had his furnace for firing his masterpieces, some debris of fine Gubbio work was found. By chance, a woman put one of these pieces that had apparently not received the last firing for the iridescent hue into the warming pan with which she was warming her hands, and the moderate heat of the ashes was sufficient to produce the iridescent effect. Imitators of this kind of work use various methods, but one of the most common is muffled glaze, specially prepared and aided by smoke, which envelops the piece when incandescent and the glaze about to melt. In France, the hard-glazed work of Palissy was naturally an incentive to the imitator's versatile aptitude, and later on to the faker's. 
being as esteemed for his work as ill-treated for his religious convictions palissy had many imitators in his own time mostly among his pupils or enthusiastic followers however palissy died in the bastille without revealing the secret of his glaze or the composition of his clay so even his followers could only grope in the dark to use the expression by which palissy defined his long and arduous research before he discovered the secret of his marvellous pottery perhaps because plagiarists are after all always plagiarists the fact remains that none of the sixteenth and seventeenth century imitators reached the level of the master however fake palaces are legion now they are of all kinds and the originals being now practically off the market museums as usual abounding in pseudo palaces so a comparison with an original is not always possible apart from his immediate followers palissy was copied and imitated at avon near fontainebleau in the seventeenth century during louis the thirteenth's reign demain a real authority on palissy ceramics mentions that many fine palaces now in museums some of them regular pastiches suggested from well-known prints of a later date than palissy according to demain some of these pieces are in the victoria and albert museum the motives of the composition old-fashioned gardens being taken from engravings in the style of les nôtres possibly dating from 1603 to 1638 in modern times there are to be noted imitations by alfred corplet a restorer of pottery who filled the market after the year eighteen fifty two with passable imitations sold as such of palissy work for a long time he had been a restorer of broken and damaged palissy work and thus he had had opportunity to study the work of the master closely and at one time his imitations fetched high prices a m pull also imitated palissy work about the year eighteen seventy eight as well as barbizet brothers of whom a plat a reptile is kept in the Sèvres museum some firms even reproduce sea fish which are never found on genuine palissies as the master only moulded such animals and fish as he found in the environs of paris there are many fakers who still love to imitate the work of palissy and if we may give advice to the inexperienced collector we would say don't go after palaces nowadays as a find in this line is almost an impossibility good originals are either kept in well-known collections or jealously guarded in museums henry ii fails the technique of which is as much a mystery as bernard palissy's glaze has also been imitated but with the exception of a few specimens the imitations are so coarse that they could hardly be dangerous even to the neophyte who had perchance some slight acquaintance with the originals as in the case of palissy however henry second ceramics do not abound on the market and such a thing as a find is not to be hoped for more common are the imitations of rouen mustier down to the ceramics of the revolution the latter were at one time in such demand that a very commercial type was produced which can be imitated of course with ease in this field also therefore do not get excited too quickly over some truculent subject with the conspicuous date of the terror naturally among these subjects the assiette au confesseur and a la guillotine depicting the execution of louis the sixteenth are too tempting to forgers not to be given a certain preference among the faked pottery of the revolution we would point out further that the pottery of all parts of the world has invariably been faked or imitated as soon as a promise of success was presented to the imitator and of gain to the faker but it is not the purpose of this work to make a long exposition of the countless types of faking which would certainly increase its bulk and risk monotony by an endless list of names and almost identical facts with the usual dramatis personae the cheater and the cheated to give an appearance of age to pottery especially glazed pottery there are various methods as we have already said sometimes it is not only a question of determining whether an object is genuine or not but as pottery is apt to be one of the most restored articles of antiquity offered to the collector 
the art lover must be acquainted with the means of detecting which parts of a piece of pottery have been restored, often over restored. There are two ways of restoring pottery where parts are missing. One is to make the missing part in clay, bake it and glaze and colour it to imitate the genuine piece of the object. When this is done, the new part is cemented to the old and the piece is supposed to have been only broken and mended, a fact that does not lessen the value of the object in the eyes of the collector so much as incompleteness would. As this operation is an extremely difficult one, which only a few specialists can perform, there is a Florentine ceramist who does it to perfection, and very expensive as well, only really fine pieces of pottery are restored in this way as a rule. Ordinary pieces are repaired as follows. The fragments of the object are carefully cemented together, and the missing parts are then supplied with plaster. Some use plaster mixed with glue, others some similar composition. In fact, any soft substance will do, if it will harden after it has been modelled and properly shaped. When the missing parts have been filled in and carefully polished with sandpaper, they are prepared for oil paint with a light coating of a weak solution of glue. After this, the artist paints in the missing pattern with oil colours and a brush, copying from the original parts of the object. This finished, the glaze is imitated by a coat of varnish. Incredible as it may sound, in the hands of a clever artist, this rather clumsy method produces an almost complete illusion. It is, however, easy to ascertain what parts have been repaired. The new parts are warmer to the touch than the glazed pottery, and they will also smell of turpentine or oil paint. Should an old mending have lost all smell, the heat of the hand is sufficient to revive it. Place your finger for a time on the part you suspect, then smell it, and you will be able to detect whether the part has been repainted with oil colours. A piece repaired by the other method is naturally more difficult to detect. An experienced eye, however, will notice some slight differences in colour and form between the old and the new parts and sometimes the join is not quite perfect, a defect that is often remedied by filling in the crack with a mastic imitating the glazed ground of the piece. This rarely occurs, however, as a good repairer can generally calculate to a nicety the shrinkage of the parts to be added and make such a neat and perfect fit that only an experienced eye can detect it. In the case of a purely modern imitation, the faker's art consists, as usual, in giving the piece a convincing appearance of age, once the actual making has been performed. This is generally effected by exposure to apparent ill usage, by greasing and smoking the object, then cleaning it and repeating the operation over and over again until the dirt has penetrated into all the cracks, or by burying it in a manure heap and letting it remain till it has lost all freshness. There are also chemical ways by which the glaze is eaten and the composition altered. It is a fact that fluoric acid readily eats the glaze just as it dissolves glass, and under certain circumstances the lead in the glaze under the form of silicate changes under the action of hydrosulfuric acids. Cracks or a regular network of craquelage are generally produced on new ceramics by the same principle as they are obtained on oil paintings, namely by producing artificially a difference in the shrinkage capacity of two superimposed layers. In oil painting it is the layer of pigment and of varnish. In the case of pottery the two layers are represented by the baked clay and the glaze. If the clay has a smaller shrinkage than the glaze, in the second firing of the piece to melt the glaze, the latter will dry in a network of cracks like those on Chinese or Japanese vases, which are reproduced by this method. Reversing the game, the glaze peels off here and there in drying and produces the imperfections sometimes desired on imitations of old and damaged pottery. An artificial disproportion between the shrinkage of the clay and the glaze is usually obtained by modifying the quality of either the one or the other. Does the clay shrink more in the firing than is desired? The ceramist generally mixes it with non-shrinking elements, such as powdered brick, or even another kind of clay which he knows must shrink less on account of its composition, although it may not be suitable in colour and quality. 
by this same modification of the composition the shrinkage of the glaze is increased or diminished glazes are generally composed of a composition of silex furnished by sand and oxide of lead with the addition of some flux such as borax with an increased quantity of silex in the composition of the glaze the shrinkage capacity is diminished consequently a predominance of the other elements lead flux etc produces the opposite effect namely giving the glaze a greater shrinkage capacity some workmen prefer to modify the quality of the clay to obtain the desired craquelage others find it more practical to modify the glaze a full account of faked china would probably fill a bulky volume it may be taken for granted that every kind of artistic china worth imitating has tempted the faker with disastrous results to the unwary collector we have mentioned some of the most noted forgeries of faience merely to show what a happy hunting ground ceramics have been to the faker of all times and with china this is doubly the case from the early attempts of botka those rare specimens of rare china down to almost modern samples of sevres there has been a long succession of types that have kept generations of fakers and imitators incessantly busy curiously enough and with no intention of cheating as far as china is concerned noted factories have themselves greatly added to the confusion between originals and copies by becoming their own plagiarists as it were by imitating old kinds thus the messon factory now puts upon the market types of old dresden very satisfactory to people not intimately familiar with the fine old models of the factory the same has been done at sevres doce and other factories then too in some cases the plagiarism is furnished with distinguishing marks that have increased the confusion for the neophyte collector be it understood it is well known for instance that before closing its doors towards the end of the eighteenth century the capo di monte factory sold all the models of the factory to ginore's noted china works at doccia and together with the models the right to use the n surmounted by a crown which was the capo di monte factory mark ginori's factory has ever since reproduced imitation capo di monte with the mark of the royal neapolitan factory of course the pieces may be sold by the firm as ginori ware and not as capo di monte but once on the market they are sure to come into the possession of some unscrupulous dealer who will palm them off as capo di monte a good connoisseur however can tell almost at sight the real capo di monte from the ones ginori's factory has been turning out for more than a century the latter are not so fine in form or colour and although made from the same mould are not so well finished and retouched as the real capo di monte apart from this a large contribution to imitations of highly refuted china is made by smaller factories that find it convenient and profitable to copy pieces of celebrated marks some of these factories even go so far as to imitate the mark rendering the deception perfect there is another form of deceit in the market for artistic china peculiar to this artistic branch many factories are in the habit of disposing of such artistic pieces as are not considered altogether up to the reputation of the factory these pieces are often bought by clever workmen who embellish them with skill and patience and then sell them profitably if the mark is missing it is added with muffled colours to obviate this irregularity some of the best factories either erase the mark on the wheel or cut certain lines in the glaze which indicate that the piece is genuine but not recognized by the factory as up to its standard of artistic value of course even a moderately expert collector knows the indelible sign made over the genuine mark but there nevertheless seem to be people who buy such pieces under the impression that they are genuine first-rate dresden whereas no other claim can be made than that the white background and the mark are authentic both baked a gran fuoco as the decoration is generally muffled work and can be executed by any skilled workman who has built a muffle in his house nowadays defective pieces are destroyed by reputable firms but years ago they were not only sold off but even given to the very factory men who took them home decorated them and put them on the market as genuine pieces 
some of these curious fakes are naturally almost as good as the genuine article being at times the work of the same artist and the defect of the first firing is not always visible as a slight curve in a dish or a tiny speck in the glaze of a vase is a sufficient blemish for the piece to be thrown aside by the factory where the faker does not always display his usual sharpness is in the falsification of marks of noted factories he is apt to make gross mistakes by copying a mark from the original without knowing the historical characteristics of the marks of certain factories their peculiarities and eventual changes take for instance the sevres mark it is known that instead of dating the pieces in figures the sevres factory began in the year 1753 to mark the pieces with an a between the entwined initials of the king's name and that each successive year was marked by the French alphabet till the letter Z was reached in 1776, after which the alphabet was repeated again, doubling each letter. Thus, 1753, A. 1776, Z. 1777, A. A. 1793, Z. Z. It is, however, not unusual to see a faked piece of Sèvres imitating the work of the end of the 18th century wrongly marked as to date, the faker having evidently copied the mark from an original, unaware that it represented a date as well. The incredible ignorance can only be explained by the fact that many of these clever imitators are artists altogether unacquainted with any information outside their imitative arts. There are also other difficulties in the imitation of Sèvres and its marks, more especially the pieces of the above series of which the faker appears to be unaware. Besides the factory mark, in the alphabet series particularly, there is always the special mark of the artist who did the decoration. These marks are generally not very conspicuous, initials, dots, lines, etc., and belong to specialists, miniature portrait painters, landscapists, or simple decorators. By copying the old marks mechanically, without knowing the information carried by the artistic's initials or marks, the faker is liable to attribute a piece of faked landscape painting to a portraitist and vice versa. Errors of this kind are more common than is generally supposed. In faked china, there is no question of patina or devices by which to confer an appearance of age to the price, nor of artificial breakages, for, by a freak of connoisseurship and contrary to faience, repaired china has lost in a great many cases all artistic and monetary value. We now turn to glassware and enamels as bearing a certain affinity in the domain of faked art and antiquities with the glazed pottery already illustrated. The Museum of Saint-Germain contains specimens of faked Roman glass with iridescent effect produced by the queer scheme of sticking fish scales to one side, which as everyone knows are iridescent, a most naive form of faking to which later progress in the grand and artistic profession of duping unwise collectors hardly renders it necessary for imitators to have recourse. Phoenician glass, the little scent bottles, the so-called lacrimatories, or tear bottles, furnish a large source of profit to the faker. They do not command high prices and appeal to the less fastidious class of collectors, tourists, and are sure of finding purchasers. Interment in earth or manure gives the desired iridescent quality to the glass in time. From these antique types we will proceed to others of more recent times which demand more care and skill to imitate, not so much on account of the art as the peculiar defects of certain kinds. While Cologne distinguishes herself with imitations of specimens of old glass, the so-called product of excavation, and other cities of Germany reproduce old national types, Italy has revived old Murano with a certain amount of success as well as various kinds of quattrocento and later samples these imitations are not always made with the intention to deceive and their success depends upon the class of collector he who has perfected his taste finds that although they may approximate to the old originals materially artistically they are wanting the excess of precision that belongs to modern reproductions somewhat lessens the artistic effect and forms one of the salient differences between old and new 
but these after all are not dangerous they represent the cabotage on the sea of deceit there are also fine pieces of real artistic value that are imitated by artists of every nation such as old bohemian chefs d'oeuvre murano chandeliers the latter sometimes composed of old and modern parts cut glass is another branch in which the skilled imitator has triumphed the work of valerio belli and others is so well imitated that even the best connoisseurs are deceived with regards to enamels we would repeat the same refrain do not buy them unless you know whence they came and until you have traced at least two or three centuries of well authenticated pedigree there are other imitations in the antique market which are quite easily distinguished but there are others regular chefs d'oeuvre of art and craft that defy and have in fact defied experience and knowledge not all imitations are by laudin or noilier whose work may be of interest to the accommodating taste of lovers of imitations but there are products of a higher grade unfortunately for collectors and museums and these are not sold as imitations but good round sums have been paid for them and they have in a way ruined the reputation of more than one collector and expert the technique of the work is identical with that of the past and the process for giving an appearance of age very much resembles that already described in this chapter though there are some fakers who claim to have found a patina that cannot be dissolved being incorporated with the enamel as a glaze obtained in the second firing the many lawsuits and summonses at the court with respect to the buying and selling of counterfeit enamels are ample proof that faking is rampant also in this interesting branch of art collecting it suffices to say that among the illustrious victims of faked enamels there is to be included the elder baron rothschild or le baron alphonse as he was briefly called among antiquaries the first of his bad experiences in faked enamel was revealed to the wealthy baron by mr mannheim one of the finest and most honest connoisseurs of paris then taking his first steps in the traffic with antiques from the first mannheim had an excellent eye and he discovered that a place of honour was being given to a false piece in baron alphonse's rare series of choicest enamels at first he did not dare to reveal the secret but after having gained the certitude that not only the one piece but others also of the collection were more or less clever fakes he took the opportunity to speak that was offered one day by the baron's praise of this fine piece of enamel at first the baron was of course obstinate in his unbelief but upon a final test and the opinion of other experts mannheim's good eye finally triumphed the chef d'oeuvre and other spurious pieces for which the multimillionaire had paid a fortune disappeared from the collection long after the above experience with which mannheim's name was connected rothschild bought an altarpiece of immense value and great artistic merit this fine enamel had been sold to the baron by a london dealer who had evidently bought the piece as an antique and did not scruple to sell the rarity to his best client for one million lira having been told by his dealer that the enamel had originally come from vienna baron rothschild one day pointed it out to an austrian attache his guest commenting upon its beauty and his own good fortune in having it in his possession he concluded by expressing his surprise that austria should let such a fine work of art cross the frontier the attache said nothing in the presence of the other guests and only whispered to his host i will come to-morrow to tell you what i think of your find the next day in fact he returned and revealed to the baron how he had been deceived in what he thought to be a precious original as it was nothing but a copy of a well-known altarpiece preserved in vienna he was even able to name the man who had made the copy of the precious enamel a certain verninger who had secretly made a reproduction while restoring the original the baron claimed and obtained his million from the london dealer whose good faith in this affair was beyond question and a warrant was issued against mr verninger the dealer did not recover the price he had paid but mr verninger was sentenced to five years imprisonment ample time in which to meditate upon the reprehensive side of his alluring art as usual we must conclude the illustration of this particular branch of the trade with a warning for if baron rothschild had to regret the acquisition of expensive enamels and he is not the only conspicuous connoisseur to do so what is the fate likely to overtake the first exploits of a neophyte in the field 
if not assisted by a first-rate expert, the freshman had better not meddle with enamels for a long time, but assuage his passion by going and admiring well-known and authentic pieces in famous museums. End of chapter 21《ハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッ cast iron pieces, chemical tests, difficulties in the connoisseurship of arms and the story of three shields, old and modern imitations, silver work, its colour and oxidisation, why artistic pieces in precious metal are in danger of being destroyed, fashion one of the dangers of silver plate, how far reliance may be placed in marks, gold work, the tiara of Satyophernes, jewels and their extreme rarity, imitations and forgeries of all ages, advice to the non-initiated in the art of buying jewels. When speaking in another part of this work about the methods of conferring an appearance of age to newly cast bronze, we remarked that the faker's best accomplice in the ageing process was chemistry. The colouring and bronzing of metals, in fact, is usually accomplished by one of two methods, by the action of chemicals or by the application of bronze powders rendered impalpable and used as a pigment. The latter method is mostly used in modern industrial art, but has, nevertheless, been applied in imitating antiques and in disguising mended parts, etc. It is often used with success in the case of imitations of excavated objects, which generally have a bluish-green patina. This may be imitated to deceive the eye of the beginner only by the application of green bronze lacquer of a dull luster, or of green varnish. The green of the bronze colour is best prepared by mixing Frankfurt black with chrome yellow. These are, however, but cheap and not always convincing expedients. The real way to give tone and colour to bronze and other metals is by resort to chemistry. A brown colour on bronze, for instance, may be obtained by preparing a sand bath large enough to contain the article to be bronzed. When the object has been cleansed from all grease by dipping in boiling potash lye, it is treated with white vinegar. After this preliminary operation, the object is wiped thoroughly dry and then rubbed with a linen rag moistened with hydrochloric acid. When this coating is perfectly dry, a quarter of an hour is sufficient, the article must be heated in the sand bath until it has acquired a bluish tint, then a final rubbing with a linen rag soaked in olive oil will change the blue colour to brown. Recipes and processes are endless, and so rich in hues that almost any tone may be obtained. To any interested in this branch of imitating old methods, we can but suggest the excellent book, the Metal Worker's Handy Book, edited by William T. Brandt. As we have said, there are many methods by which to give the proper patina to metals, and a good deal of mystery, some fakers and imitators claiming to be in possession of unrevealed secrets. When exposed to the air for a long time, copper and bronze acquire a fine brown or green patina, which, as every collector knows, greatly enhances the merits of an artistic piece in these two metals. A perfect imitation of the result of a long process of time is not an easy matter, in fact an almost impossible task. Formerly, the patina of a bronze was in a way the final test of authenticity, but nowadays there are modern imitations of so deceptive a character that the best connoisseurs are taken in. One of the best known methods by which old patina is imitated on copper and bronze is to follow as closely as possible the process by which the genuine patina is produced. Thus, the action of rain, interment, immersion in some permeating substance that will generate hydrosulfuric acid are called into service by those willing to wait a comparatively long time for the desired effects. Others accelerate the above process by increasing the proportion of the natural conducive elements. 
the objects are also treated with water containing ammonia, carbonic acid, etc., exposed to the intense and direct action of vapour or vaporised acid in order to produce those basic salts that form a certain patina. To obtain the malachite kind of patina that generally characterises objects found in the ground, the imitator generally brushes the metal over with a very weak solution of cupric nitrate to which a small quantity of common salt in solution may be added. When completely dry it is again brushed over with a liquid consisting of a hundred parts of weak vinegar, five of sal ammoniac, and one of oxalic acid, and the application is repeated after the first has dried. In about a week's time the metal will have acquired a green-brown colour that may be polished within caustic if the patina is to have a shiny appearance. Such is the light motif, more or less, of the processes of obtaining the green or brown-green patinae. Some dip the object in cupric acid and then place it in a room in which an excess of carbonic acid is produced. By others, preference is given to one or the other elements according to the tone and colour desired. Brass articles are coated with green patina by solutions containing 150 parts of vinegar to which has been added 10 parts of copper dissolved in 20 of nitric acid. An application of this liquid is generally made on the object. The brown patina usually characterising old metals is obtained in many ways. One is by heating the metal at the flame of a spirit lamp and then brushing it with graphites. To colour a number of metals at the same time, some imitators dissolve 30 parts of verdigris and 30 parts of sal ammoniac in 10 of water, adding water to the solution until a precipitate is no longer formed. Then the metals are placed in a shallow dish without touching one another and the boiling solution is poured over them. The metals are allowed to remain in the solution till they have acquired the desired tint, which should be a fine brown. Green or bluish patiny may also be given to bronze or copper by triturated copper carbonate used as a paint with a pale spirit varnish, shellac or sanderac and applied with a brush. Verdigris generally gives a bluish tint and crystallised verdigris a pale green tint. The two tones can be mingled to obtain some special hue. Ironwork is perhaps one of the easiest to imitate and give an appearance of antiquity. As far as the actual work is concerned, it rests entirely upon the skill and artistic taste of the worker. Patina on iron is either caused simply by rust or by a slow process of oxidation which confers a rich, dark tone to iron. There is also a special patina seen on iron that has been under water for a long time, but this is rare in imitations and very difficult to obtain. The rusty coating on iron can be produced by almost any preparation capable of oxidising the surface or transforming it into basic salt provided a red colour results, as with nitric or hydrochloric acid for instance. The brown patina is often obtained by oiling the piece and exposing it to the direct action of flame. The two methods may be alternated and the corrosion of the acid here and there adds character to the piece. Methods are so various, however, that the way to obtain a convincing patina is perhaps contained in the dictum of an Italian antiquary to inflict upon the object that is to be turned into an antique every possible indignity and abuse. The patina in imitations of old ironwork is so well reproduced nowadays that even experts are unable to distinguish the real from the unreal with certainty, so much so that more than one has had recourse to an analysis of the composition of the iron in order to decide whether the object were modern or antique. This justifies the verdict of Moreau, an expert and celebrated artist in iron, who, when called upon to decide whether a certain artistic key exhibited at the Paris World Exhibition of 1878 were really of ancient workmanship, replied that he could not tell unless he were allowed to break the key and examine the grain of iron. Italy is one of the countries where the imitation of old iron is traditional. In olden times it was the work of Capara and other artists of the Renaissance that were imitated. Nowadays old models are reproduced for the benefit of the tourist and some are conceived in the old style with extreme perfection for those collectors who go in for originals and who buy this modern work as genuine chef d'oeuvre of the Quattrocento and Cinquecento. Florence, Venice and the town of Urbino furnish the Italian market with the best imitations of old candelabra, andirons, gates, lamps and keys. 
in fact everything that is likely to attract the tourist or please the collector. Nearly every country possesses good imitators of artistic old iron, which is perhaps due to the fact that such imitations do not require any great artistic ability, nor is the coat of rust on modern iron a matter incurring expense or complicated methods. The most difficult in this field are the imitations of arms of all kind, which require a skilful workman and often a finished artist in ironwork. In this particular branch of faking, it is not only a question of reproducing old weapons of a national character, but the forger frequently turns his attention to imitating arms of exotic type. We all know that Constantinople is the place par excellence for imitations of old oriental arms and armour, but very few are aware that when they buy an oriental poniard or Turkish gun ornamented with passages from the Quran in Africa, for instance, they are buying goods made in Germany. As a matter of fact, however, German factories supply oriental maritime markets with all their fine arms. We still recollect the amazement of an American tourist who, on returning from a fair near Tangiers, showed the hotel keeper his find, a fine Morocco knife with a carved scabbard in brass, and was told that it was German. As he persisted in his incredulity, the hotel keeper showed him the mate of his bargain, which had been presented to him by the German commercial traveller who had lodged in his hotel. As usual, collectors of the genre being diverse as to taste and calibre as connoisseurs, the accommodating faker has goods to suit the varied scale of his clients, or rather there are fakers of arms and armour, like the Venetian rubbish, which is for easily pleased greenhorns, and others producing fine goods for the man of exquisite taste, such as the products of Vienna, Belgium, France, and sundry Italian artists of forged steel. We have purposefully made a distinction by saying sundry Italian artists, because while the imitation of arms in other countries assumes the character of factory work of extremely good quality, in Italy the artist who forges steel, chisels it and imitates old weapons is usually a solitary worker in his own home, a fact that makes him far more dangerous to the collector. These artists are often simply imitators of the old style whose work is sold by others as antique. One of them used to live in Lucca, whose imitations of old daggers Cinque Dei, or Lingue di Bove, have become famous. Another in a town of northern Italy imitates Negroli and Milanese work with uncommon success. Many of these artists, who imitated and copied old Damascened work to perfection, with no thought of cheating, have executed fine work that can stand upon its own merit, so to say. Such, for instance, is the work of Zuloaga, the father of the painter of that name, and of another Spaniard of repute in the artistic world, Mariano Fortuni. This excellent painter was also a first-rate chiseller and good artist in Damascened work. He imitated the Moresque style to perfection. At the sale that took place after his death, one of his reproductions, a Damascene sword, fetched the price of 15,000 francs and was sold with no other recommendation than that of being a modern imitation of the antique by Mariano Fortuni. In a letter written to the well-known amateur Baron de Villiers, Fortuny speaks of a flourishing factory near his studio in which excellent imitations of armour were made, chiefly repoussé swords. It may be taken for granted that if such a judge as Fortuny called the imitation of this Roman work excellent, some of them are at present enriching well-known collections. There is a scarcity of genuine pieces on the market, in fact hardly a single fine Cinquecento sword or halberd is to be seen in shops now or is for sale. The few still obtainable are poor specimens as a rule, and this fact ought to put the neophyte on his guard when he is offered some gorgeously ornamented sword, pike, ranseur, or partisan lavishly chased and gilded. Some years ago, an elegant lady was asked why the fair sex preferred to dress elaborately rather than in the stylish simplicity of tailor-made gowns, to which she replied, perhaps because it is less expensive. In a way, the fine plain swords and unornamented pieces of armour are more difficult to fake. They would seem to demand the same eye for form as a perfect cut, well-fitting, simple tailor-made gown. This, combined with the collector's cheap taste in arms, may be the reason why the faker gives preference to imitations loaded with chaste or damascened ornamentation, and enriched with gilding and elaborate arabesques. 
the rarity of imitations of fine weapons characterized by elegant lines simplicity and sobriety of ornament suggested to the author some years ago the solution to a difficult problem propounded by baron nathaniel rothschild when called to baron rothschild's magnificent mansion in vienna i found this rich and sagacious collection had received two fine swords that were being offered for sale one was simplicity itself the other over ornamented and lavishly gilded on blade and hilt which do you advise me to buy i must decide between the two to be frank they both look genuine to me but the baron's question roused a suspicion in my mind that one of the two swords was a forgery i should buy this one i answered pointing to the sword almost deprived of ornament you have a good eye complimented the baron the other sword is an imitation one of the most admirable i have ever seen my discernment however was merely based on the accepted aphorism that the combination in art of simplicity and extreme elegance is difficult to imitate otherwise who knows but what i might not have selected the faked sword it must be added here that an imitation can very rarely bear close comparison with a genuine piece the proximity of the genuine article is always rather disastrous to the fake and never more so than in the case of arms and armour this may be accounted for by the difference in the modern methods of working and ornamenting steel these methods not only produce a difference in the raw and worked steel that connoisseurs claim to distinguish but the ornamentation itself is wrought by other means engraved ornaments especially on pieces that do not aim to deceive first-rate connoisseurs are rarely done by the old method but preferably by acids damascening such as is rarely done now even in the east was a skilful and complicated operation by which steel blades and armours were inlaid with gold or silver ornamentations the designs were first cut deep into the steel with a burin then the gold or silver was beaten in with a hammer not only until the surface was smooth but until the inset was securely worked into and held by all the irregularities of the groove such work is now imitated by gilding over a rather shallow groove obtained by the action of nitric acid the sombre shine of old steel is generally reproduced by a thin coat of encaustic the sum total of these differences together with a certain loss of artistic sense in the art are the causes perhaps of the most disastrous effect upon fakery of a close proximity with genuineness as above noted this of course is in common cases for as we have said there are sporadic workers in steel who produce pieces that baffle the best connoisseurs as an artistic object cannot always be tested by breaking it and examining the texture of the metal which would be the safest method at present here again we are forced to advise the newcomer in the field of connoisseurship during his search for arms in his first enthusiastic stage to use more than one grain of salt with what he hears and several pounds of scepticism when he comes across what would seem to be a real find for over thirty years arms we mean fine specimens have practically disappeared from the market pistols guns and weapons of a late epoch may still be seen but not swords of the quattrocento and early cinquecento also in this field the semi-faked article has the usual luck of fetching a good price with the majority of collectors plain old pistols are often embellished with all kinds of most seductive additions mottoes are engraved or inlaid in silver on blades originally simple but deprived of the elegant simplicity to which we have already alluded these however are the cheap articles of the trade but the story of three shields a well-known incident still recounted among paris collectors offers ample proof that there are also in this field imitations that defy the best connoisseurs as we have already said and gladly repeat in order to render our warning to the novice all the more emphatic one of these skilled imitators flourished several years ago in italy's chief rival in antiquities and faking we refer of course to spain the first of the three identical shields all of which came to paris was palmed off on mr didier petit an excellent connoisseur who paid the good round sum of four hundred pounds for this fine piece of imitation it was repoussé work with a mythological subject in the centre jove fulminating the titans the person to be struck down really however was poor mr didier petit rather than the titans for on realizing that he had been fooled he died of grief or apoplexy brought on by his delusion and wounded pride as a connoisseur 
under the auctioneer's hammer at a subsequent sale, the famous shield fetched £20. The second of identical make was very nearly passed off on Baron de Villiers, perhaps the most esteemed connoisseur of his time. Baron de Villiers was offered the rare piece in Spain. He was struck at first by its beauty and appearance of authenticity, as well as the plausible story by which the owner explained his possession of such a valuable object. The bargain was struck at £320, and, happy over his piece of good luck, Baron de Villiers, like a true collector, hastened to convey his find safely to his home in Paris. Noticing at the custom house that the official treated his precious find with indifference, he became suspicious, and his suspicion of having been cheated grew to certainty before the end of the journey. It would take long to recount the circumstances by which Baron de Villiers recovered his £320. Suffice it to say that he did recover them, and the Spaniard replaced the faked shield in the panoply from whence the Baron had taken it down, swearing all the time that it was genuine, even though the Baron had seen another like it, that there might be twins among articles of vertu, etc., but there was still the third of the shield triplet fated to come to Paris, bought by the well-known expert called, or rather nicknamed, Couvre. Curiously enough, this third expert from one and the same city was also a specialist in arms, as Baron de Villiers might have been considered, had his immense knowledge not conferred upon him the character of a specialist in almost every branch of connoisseurship. Where did Couvre buy this third shield? From the very man who tried to cheat Baron de Villiers. It appears that it was not the same shield as the Baron's, though of identical workmanship, for there were trifling differences between it and the fake number two to reach Paris. Couvreur had paid a fine price for his find, £800. He never recovered his money and created a scandal by presenting the piece for exhibition at the World Show of 1878, insulting the judges upon their refusal to place it among the genuine pieces. Thus he lived and died maintaining that all who believed the piece to be a fake were fools. This story only goes to prove that in every branch of imitation or faking there exist some artists of unusual talent able almost to attain perfection. Those who remember the story of the famous Gladius Rogieri, quoted by Paul Eudel in his amusing book Le Tucage, and all the discussion held in court over this supposed sword of the valiant King Robert of Sicily, are aware of how a good connoisseur such as Monsieur Basilewski and a well-informed dealer like Monsieur Novilos can be taken in by a fine piece of faking, and how a legion of experts may give contrary evidence as to the authenticity of an object. And if this could happen in Paris, one of the most enlightened cities as to connoisseurship, and among a coterie of specialists, it may be imagined what possibilities for deception are offered by America, that El Dorado of fakers. While speaking of first-rate imitations by fakers conscientious enough to use steel, we may add that there are successful imitations in which iron and cast iron have been substituted for the orthodox metal of weapons. The learned Demont declares that the casting, which forgery has made it very difficult to recognise, is a source of no little embarrassment to collectors. He suggests that when there is a suspicion that a piece is cast, an unimportant part of it should be filed and, as usual, the texture of the material be examined. If, under the magnifying glass, the grain appears coarser and very shiny, the piece has been cast. To tell iron from steel, Demon suggests that a drop of sulphuric acid diluted with water should be applied. If the action of this liquid turns the metal black, it is steel. If a greenish mark is made that can be easily washed away with water, then it is iron. The black stain is produced on steel because the acid eats into the iron, and not the carbon contained in the composition of steel. Before closing the topics of arms and armour, we may observe that marks on these pieces, whether engraved or impressed, are hardly a guarantee, as marks can be easily imitated on these articles as on any other kind of artistic imitation. In the case of weapons, they have even been imitated by workers contemporary with the artist they fraudulently copy, in order to take advantage of the high reputation of certain marks. The work of a Missaglia, Domenico or Filippo Negroli, however, is not only attested by the stamped name, or Sigla, but by the inimitable sum total of their art. Many imitators have made a great study of copying impressed marks, but have neglected or failed to copy the individual characteristics that bear witness to an artist as much as his signature. 
in the imitation and faking of ancient art in its various branches the methods and the results all differ so little that we fear to grow monotonous in this brief sketch of the questionable trade when now entering another class of metalwork that of silver and gold the precious metals require no recipes for patiny as patiny play no part this is especially so in the case of gold but as naive collectors of all branches of art present the same idiosyncrasies it is evident that the general trend of trickery in the human comedy is more or less identical when allowance is made for the different materials peculiar to each particular art indeed the whole matter might be reduced to a simple equation with no unknown quantity namely a fool on one side and on the other a fraud which works out to a positive and disastrous result for the former in the case of silver although there is not exactly a question of patina properly so called there is certainly a question of colouring or oxidising for old silver as everyone knows never keeps the brightly shining appearance of a new piece it rather improves with time by the acquisition of a low pleasing tonality which has a most favourable effect a sort of pleasing light and shade which the flat negative shininess of a new piece rarely possesses in england the conservatism of the upper classes has preserved some really genuine silver articles with duly authenticated pedigree in france the spirit of the revolution may be possible to a certain extent for the scarcity of rich pieces of artistic silver only long before the ruit horror of the revolution various circumstances had rendered the life of artistic silver precarious risks to which all artistic objects in precious metals are liable many pieces of silver in fact were coined into money during louis the fourteenth's time when the state became a financial wreck under the glorious reign of the roi soleil changing fashion and taste also combined with the fact that the silver was for use and not collections contributed to the destruction of old types of silver plate to make way for new ones more in keeping with the new forms dictated by fashion or altered taste to the combined effect of financial distress and changing taste italy also owes the destruction of old silver that would otherwise have come down to us intact just as nowadays plated silver is likely to pass undisturbed from one generation to another it is not uncommon in italy to hear that some aristocratic family had ancient silver melted down a few years ago to make new and commonplace tablespoons and forks a lady from siena who did this for a whim kept one piece of the old silver service and was much astonished to learn later that this one piece alone would have fetched a sum sufficient to buy the coveted new set of table silver in italy and more especially in tuscany the heavy taxes levied by napoleon during the occupation forced many florentine families to get rid of their silver plate as a matter of fact in italy and elsewhere fine pieces are very rare nowadays yet a few years ago fickle fashion helped several people of good taste to form excellent collections gatherings of artistic pieces that the art lover would seek in vain today that was the happy time when old-fashioned and yet artistic silver was hardly reckoned above the intrinsic value of the metal it contained fifty or so years ago it was not uncommon for one of the few collectors of artistic silver to come across some artistic beauty offered at so much a gram generally a very moderate figure slightly above the current price of the metal or at times the actual value of the silver to quote one instance out of many in eighteen fifty five at the sale held after the death of mademoiselle mazancourt some particularly fine flambeaux and other pieces of silver were sold at the price of twenty centimes a gram such conditions explain how baron pichon a collector of taste was able to buy for the moderate sum of three hundred francs an artistic bowl which was sold at his death for fourteen thousand francs a price that could easily be surpassed nowadays unfortunately for the true collector not only has old silver become fashionable but it has become fashionable to be a collector of artistic silver and thus real connoisseurship and ignorant greedy wealth have started the usual competition that inevitably creates an artificial standard of values all too apt to general faking faked silver in fact came at once triumphantly to the front in forms of all kinds entirely new pieces successfully paraded as old were launched upon the market as well as plain old pieces decked out with the heavy ornamentation likely to suit the taste of the parvenu 
There were also the usual piecemeal of different authentic parts, joined together more or less harmoniously by modern work, in fact all that the faker's genius and versatility is able to produce. Silver marks, which on genuine pieces guarantee the quality of the metal and the authenticity of the piece as the work of a certain artist, factory or mint, can unfortunately be imitated with success. In fact, the faker, who is a good psychologist and knows that the neophyte amateur relies largely upon his knowledge of marks, generally expends great care upon the imitation of the various hallmarks. Though, as we have already said, silver has no patina, properly so called, there is the tone and colour which has to be imitated. To dull silver, to give it, we mean, the leaden brownish colour acquired by age, a mixture of sulphur or chlorine is used. A solution of pentasulfide of potassium, the liver of sulphur of the shops, is generally used. Liver of sulphur is prepared by thoroughly mixing and heating together two parts of well-dried potash and one of sulphur powder. This mixture also takes effect on cupriferous silver, but the result is not so fine. A velvety black is obtained by dipping the article in a solution of mercurious nitrate previous to oxidisation. This method is used when a half polish is to be given to the silver, leaving the dark tones in the grooves. Another method consists of dipping the article in chlorine water, a solution of chloride of lime, or into eau de javel. Special works on metal also give many other methods, and it is for the imitator to choose the best adapted for the particular case, and to use his artistic criterion to obtain a convincing effect. Passing on to gold, more especially in jewellery, we may say that imitators and fakers have wrought havoc, by filling the market with spurious products. Imitation in this branch ranges from copying the old art of working gold, of which the famous tiara of Satia Fernes, bought by the Louvre, is one of the most striking examples, to the small piece of jewellery which imitated enamels or more or less genuine stones. In this line there is something to suit all tastes, from the eager connoisseur, difficult to please, still on the lookout for the marvellous jewellery of the Renaissance and early 16th century, to the less exclusive, satisfied with later epochs, down to the 18th century. There is no way of helping the neophyte to collect jewellery, not only because fine old pieces are extremely rare, but because no advice or theoretical hints can help the discernment of the genuine article, only sound and well-tested experience, gained often at great cost, is of any real avail. In this branch also there are imitations that are entirely new and others, like the above said tiara, that have become such by the preponderance of restored parts or because the latter are the most important artistically speaking. In the tiara of Satia Fernes, the genuine part, if genuine, is the upper portion of the domed tiara, which is said to have been an ancient drinking cup reversed and placed at the top of the tiara. Many well-imitated rings are really old, worn-out rings used for the circle to show that they have been used, on which the artistic setting of the jewel or other ornamented part has been soldered. In conclusion, when you would buy old jewellery, buy as if it were modern and pay the price of imitations. Then, if by some rare chance you are mistaken, you will experience the unique pleasure of possessing a find, but never reverse the process, for if you buy an ancient piece of jewellery, you will certainly realise in due time that it is really modern. End of chapter 22Chapter 23 of The Gentle Art of Faking by Riccardo Nobili. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. Chapter 23 Woodwork and Musical Instruments. Carved wood, artistic furniture, wood staining and patina, the merits of elbow grease, painted and lacquered furniture, veneer and inlaid work, musical instruments. Imitations and fakers of musical instruments. Connoisseurship of musical instruments twofolds. Attribution and labels. Some good imitators. The violin as example. The restoration and odd adventures of well-known musical instruments. Legends and anecdotes that help. 
analysis of form and of sound. Rossini's saying. The finest pieces of faked furniture are very rarely entirely new. Sometimes they are old pieces to which rich ornaments have been added. At other times, and this is the most common occurrence, they are put together from fragments belonging to two, three or even four different pieces, the parts and debris, in fact, of old broken furniture. There is also the entirely new fake imitating old furniture, but this is rarely as convincing as the other which is the really dangerous type even for an experienced collector. Impressed by the great amount of faked furniture glutting the Paris market, Paul Udall says, In principle there is no more such a thing as antique furniture. All that is sold is false or terribly repaired. In Italy, that inexhaustible mine of past art, it is still possible to find genuine pieces, provided, of course, that the collector does not insist upon having those first-rate pieces now belonging to museums or collections formed several years ago. There are, however, in Italy, as in every other country, modern productions of antique furniture for the novices in the collector's career. This furniture may be carved out of old pieces of wood or ordinary wood. In both cases, it is generally necessary to give an old colouring to the wood, for which there are a variety of methods according to the desired effect, tone, colour, etc. Many use walnut juice, others permanganate of potash, and still others the more drastic system of burning the surface of the wood with acid. The old way of imitating worm holes was to use buckshot, a ridiculous method which nevertheless had its vogue, and apparently satisfied the gross eye of some collectors. Nowadays worm holes are made with an instrument that imitates them to perfection, although they do not go so deep as the genuine ones, and this difference, by the way, is one of the tests to tell real worm holes from spurious ones. As new furniture that imitates old is generally too sharp-edged and neatly furnished, it is usually subjected to a regular cause of ill-treatment. French dealers call this process aviler un meuble, and it consists of pounding with heavy sticks, rubbing with sandpaper, pumice, etc. The finishing touch, that peculiar polished surface characterising ancient furniture, is usually given by friction with wool after a slight coating of benzene in which a little wax has been dissolved. The less wax used and the more elbow grease, the more will the polish resemble that of real old furniture, and the more difficult does it become to detect the deceit. If much wax has been used, the scratch of a needle is sufficient to reveal even the thinnest layer, but if it is so imperceptible as to stand this test, it is very difficult to tell the real from the imitation. The polished parts of an old piece of furniture are not casual, but the result of long use. Prominent parts are naturally, therefore, the ones to get so polished rather than other parts. I remember witnessing a curious sight one day when admitted to the sanctum of a well-known antiquary. Half a dozen stools had been repaired, most generously repaired. A new patina had been given, and now they were to receive the last touches, the polished parts that add such charm to old furniture. The workman who had half finished the job kept passing and repassing close to the stools which he had arranged in a row, rubbing his legs against each one. I asked him the meaning of the performance, and he answered that as there were no sharp edges on the lower parts of those 16th century walnut stools, he wanted to find out where and to what extent they would be most polished by use. Not having a genuine stool from which to copy, he had to resort to this means so as to make no mistake. I very nearly asked him if he thought everyone was the same height and had the same length of leg. But as the work proceeded, I gathered from the practical application of his method, better than I could have done from any explanation, that he was endeavouring to get a mere hint where to begin to rub with his pad in order to produce that vague patch of hollows one notices sometimes in church benches. The same patience is necessary in making imitation wormholes, which are so cunningly distributed, so convincingly worked in their erratic manner of piercing wood, as to suggest to Edmund Bonafé the fine bit of sarcasm, des vers savants chargés de fouiller le bois neuf à la demande. That piecemeal kind of furniture, the parts of which are unquestionably antique, but of various origins, being the remains of more than one piece of furniture, l'assemblage, as the French call it, 
may prove a danger to the best connoisseurs if done well and with taste. In certain respects, the piece is genuinely antique, but not exactly as the collector understands the word, hence its fraudulency entitles it to be classified among fakes. It is incredible what an industrious antiquary is able to do in the way of piecing furniture together. This consists not merely of finding a top for table legs or legs for a table top, but there is no limit to the invention of this piecemeal furniture. A wooden door may furnish the back of a throne when well matched with a rich old coffer. The gilded ornamentation of an altar may be transformed into the head of a Louis XV bed, and so on. In the same way, a simple piece of furniture may be enriched by attaching ornaments, coats of arm, etc. The whole is invariably toned and harmonised by means of one of the above-mentioned methods. Naturally, ignorance of style sometimes leads some fakers to extremely amusing blunders, but it must be confessed the cases are rare, and this piecemeal furniture has been palmed off on too many connoisseurs and graces too many well-refuted collections to be dismissed with a smile of incredulity. Were antiquaries more disposed to talk or less indulged towards the conceit of collectors, it might be learned that all the rich furniture sold during the last twenty years to museums and collectors belongs to this composite order. A special branch of the imitation of antique furniture is inlaid work, the French marqueterie and Italian tassia, by which designs are traced upon the surface by inlaying wood, ivory or metal. There are various epochs and styles of inlaid furniture. One may begin with the geometrical patterns of the Trecento, or the Cappuccino of about the same time and later, and gradually pass through the many styles and methods to the complex ornamentation of Boulle's work. The early work, including the Cappuccino, a peculiar inlaid ivory work with geometric patterns, is very well imitated in Italy, where restorers of this kind of furniture generally turn into good imitators and become at times impenitent fakers of the most fantastic would-be old style. Skill in inlaying wood and ivory according to different epochs and the ordinary collector's love of ornamented furniture have suggested to some imitators the most absurd combinations of styles, a riot of incongruity and incompatibility. It is not rare to see fine chairs that would otherwise be tasteful but for the heavy ornamentation of inlaid wood or ivory arabesques, grotesques, etc. The outrage of having a 15th century inlaid after the style and designs of at least a century later is not uncommonly excused by the explanation that it appeals to the tawdry taste of customers and that the article commands a higher price by the addition of the heavy incongruous ornamentation. This peculiar form of degeneration in taste, the passion for excessive ornamentation, is also what often mars the imitations of the 17th and 18th century painted furniture, imitations of the Venetian style especially being generally very carelessly finished, but overcharged with gilding and cheap bits of painted ornamentation. French imitations in this line are not so debased as some Italian, but like them they are not very convincing, as it is almost impossible to imitate the 18th century gilding, and the carving of this epoch shows such neatness and is so clean cut that the gilded parts assume an appearance of metal, a quality that the modern industry of antiques does not find convenient or is unable to imitate. The French boule is often imitated with celluloid instead of tortoise shell, and can only succeed in attracting the very easily satisfied collector. This is the case with some other cheap imitations overcharged with ordinary gilded bronze. By the side of these specimens, however, French art also counts some excellent imitations done by real artists, which if not successful in deceiving experienced collectors are nevertheless regular chefs dœuvre in the art of imitating the finest and richest pieces of Louis XV and Louis XVI styles. The simplicity and purity of line that characterised English styles from the end of the 17th century to the best period of the next helped to keep the imitators of this country within bounds. Their fancy in any case was less inventive and less disastrously enterprising than that of the cheap imitators of Italian furniture. Before leaving the subject, we may say that many of the walnut panels in furniture, which appear to be so elaborately carved, are not carved at all, but burnt into the desired patterns. The process consists of making a good cast iron matrix from a fine bas-relief, 
then heating it and pressing it upon the wood by a special procedure by which all the superfluous wood is burnt away and the rest takes the shape of the mould. This method not only gives the wood the desired form in perfect imitation of carving, but the burning stains it to a very fine brown tone very much resembling old wood, after which an application of oil or encaustic is sufficient to give it a semblance of patina. In another part of this book we have noted that in Bologna more especially imitations of old tables are placed for a time in cheap restaurants where, through grease, dirt and rough wear and tear, they acquire that fine patina so highly esteemed in ancient wood. Such pieces are not only found in towns but are housed here and there about the country, sometimes in old palaces and villas or else in out-of-the-way nooks. The former system gives the alluring sensation of buying something really worth while and at first hand from its historical owner, the latter that a real find has been discovered, that find which is the eternal fata morgana of freshman collectors. Imitations of musical instruments vary according to the style of the instrument and its musical quality. In some fakes the musical quality is of minor importance to a certain extent, the artistic properties and ornamentation being the chief consideration with the collector. In other instruments the quality of the tone is of importance, so that though the form may not be neglected, the faker must bear in mind that his imitation will have to stand a double test, it must satisfy the ear and stand the examination of an experienced eye. The first class includes collectively such instruments as are no longer in use and are highly ornamented with carving, inlaid work or gilding such as lutes, archilutes, harps, virginals spinets etc the second comprises instruments that are still in use such as violins cellos etc the ornamental strange and obsolete instruments are the ones that fake is chiefly furnished to the ordinary trade naturally the trade in imitating instruments for the mere curio hunter and non-musical collector is not so remunerative as other branches of the shady art of faking the number of collectors in this branch is comparatively restricted, many of them talented and not easily duped, as is the case in all branches not enjoying popularity. The tourist would rather go home with a painting or a faked bronze of Naples or elsewhere than carry an instrument he cannot play, which will probably be an encumbrance and dust catcher in the small rooms of big cities. On the other hand, however, there is nothing complicated about this branch of faking. It is usually an easy matter for a guitar or mandolin maker to invest in the small amount of material needed and to turn his hand to the work. It must also be taken into account that these workers are very often repairers of ancient instruments whereby they learn to make their imitations technically correct, though this is by no means always the case. We have, indeed, seen appalling exceptions, pianos of an early period transformed into spinets, lutes with grotesque and impossible fingerboards, etc. Some careless and certainly unmusical imitators go so far as to make instruments that could never be played, and even put common wire instead of gut strings, which makes one wonder what kind of collector it can be who delights in such delusions. Our intention is to deal only with the artistic side of musical instruments, so we lay no claim to the real connoisseurship of musical instruments, more especially as regards the family of stringed instruments which finds its best and most complete expression in the violin. Yet the fact that the great discoveries have generally been made by ignorant men such as Tarissio, not necessarily fine musicians, goes to show that connoisseurship of form has its importance, greatly resembling, after all, the connoisseurship of other branches in its summing up of various analyses into a final synthesis of form and character. True, in a good violin there is rarely any ornamentation, or if there is, it still more rarely furnishes a clue. But although all is entrusted to simplicity of line and form in its most aristocratic and elemental expression, there still seems to be enough to tell of the touch of a vanished hand. How interesting, justly remarks Olga Raxter, it is to observe an expert spelling out the name of an old fiddle by the aid of this touch of a vanished hand. How eagerly he seeks it and finds it with the help of that alphabet which lies concealed in the colour, shape, height and curves of an old violin. Together with the difficulty of faking instruments, the synthesis of connoisseurship in this line could not be better expressed. As for the quality of the tone, the expert relies purely and simply upon his ear. No book or hints of a practical character can assist the expert to perfect his ear. 
all depends on natural disposition and the experience of a well-trained organ in this most important part of connoisseurship of musical instruments when rossini was asked what is required to make a good singer he said three things voice 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 the quotation fits here for the chief requirement of a good connoisseur of musical instruments as regards their musical quality consists of a triply good ear End of chapter 23chapter 24 of the gentle art of faking by ricardo nobili this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jordan watts oxfordshire chapter 24 velvets tapestries and books ola Padrida, genuine and faked antique stuffs the peculiar knowledge necessary to an expert on stuffs the difficulty in imitating renaissance velvet collectors of costumes Collections of dolls, tapestries, repairs and faked parts or qualities, book collecting, two types of book collectors, the faking of editions and rare bindings, the extended and ambitious activity of the art of faking, faked aerolites. Assembling in this chapter a variety of objects under the title of minor branches of art collecting, we do not use the term artistically, but merely because these branches apparently attract fewer art lovers than the others, and the activity of the faker is more restricted in these cases. In many of these branches, too, the art of collecting and connoisseurship is reduced to technical knowledge, and artistic sentiment plays a very secondary part if there is any one branch of collecting in which it is necessary to be a specialist to ensure success that branch is unquestionably antique stuffs artistic sentiment and good taste are of comparatively slight assistance compared with technical knowledge and they may even at times produce two dangerous psychological elements only too often responsible for collectors blunders enthusiasm and suggestion the technician with knowledge of the different qualities of materials with an eye for the various peculiarities of the weave and colour and sound information as to the character of the various patterns etc is doubtlessly the best equipped as a connoisseur of stuffs this may sound absurd to the outsider especially to artists whom we have ourselves found to be overconfident as to their qualities their pictorial eye their full acquaintance with form yet too many of these artists not being collectors or experts have bought modern goods as antique old furniture recovered with modern brocade that no expert would for a moment have taken as being of the same date as the furniture we refer of course to those modern imitations generally the easiest to detect however artfully they have been coloured and aged to give them the appearance of genuine antiquity the detection of modern products offers no difficulty to the expert they may look extremely convincing to the uninitiated or beginner as they possess what may be termed a general impression of antiquity but to the trained eye of the expert there are too many essential differences and they lack above all a character that in the case of a large quantity of stuff and not a mere sample is inimitable for the jacquard machine is not the old weaving loom the material used is produced with greater care and precision which gives the fabric a different look even when the coarseness of ancient textiles has been imitated the colours are different and so is the chemical process for dyeing the thread etc the sum total of these elementary differences with which the art of imitation cannot cope is what reveals to the expert almost at sight the antiquity or modernity of the product in conclusion with the exception of some rare samples of small pieces the modern imitation of ancient stuffs is but a successful optical illusion imitations that count at least a century of age on the contrary prove dangerous puzzles to experts and connoisseurs of this speciality these imitations having been made in almost exactly the same way as the originals before weaving machines were invented and when the thread was spun and dyed in the simple old way before aniline dyes had furnished beautiful but most unstable colours in france under louis the thirteenth renaissance patterns were admirably copied as well as those of the sixteenth century the reproduction of old designs is not confined to italy and france alone 
in nearly every country there have been imitations of the best samples of ancient stuffs damasks brocades and velvets as regards imitation the more complex the pattern in design and colouring the easier it can be reproduced with success in fact plain velvet is the most difficult to imitate no one not even in the past has ever reproduced the fine velvet of the quattrocento and early cinquecento with complete success methods of aging modern stuff which have not the advantage of the genuine hues of age of old imitations greatly resemble in general lines those adopted to give the appearance of age to other objects if the colouring is crude and too new looking the stuff is exposed to atmospheric action rain dew and sunshine needless to add this treatment must be followed with care and discrimination otherwise the fabric may be reduced to a rag as well as to an appearance of age to harmonize the colors and give them a more faded look some put the goods in a bath of slightly tinted liquid thus obtaining on the fabric what in painting is termed velatura others put the liquid into an atomizer and steam it onto the stuff this process has the advantage of giving alternate hues without any sharp delimitation between them these methods however by which the artist can display variation are not convenient or possible in the case of large quantities of fabric nor is the result convincing in the proximity of the original one does not need to be an expert in fact to see the difference between the old and the new on a piece of furniture or in a room where imitations have been used to supply what was lacking to make imitations more convincing more especially in the case of small pieces some antiquaries stitch on bands before discolouring the stuff which are afterwards taken off leaving parts with fresher colours as often happens in really antique pieces that have belonged to ecclesiastical copes etc strict order having been dispensed with in this chapter and as after all fabrics are involved we may here touch upon the subject of dress and past costume the rarity of such collections depends not only upon the fact that the roomy space of a museum is indispensable for their display but largely upon the scarcity of past century costumes this branch of collecting is very useful to the history of fashion and national costumes but it must be considered that to be of interest to the collector a dress must be at least forty years old and very few garments attain that age nowadays either they are altered to conform to fashion or unpicked or given away until they have run through the scale of society and end in rags the rarity of the genuine article appears to correspond with the rarity of collectors of this line and there is therefore no question of fakes unless one should take seriously certain comic incidents and consider as a collector the simpleton who buys the cast-off costumes of an elegant fancy dress ball as genuine articles those poor imitations with no pretence of being anything else of henry the fourth marie antoinette and other historical garments having mentioned the subject of costumes we may speak of another kind of collection that is also very useful to the history of past usages and fashions that of dolls and toys of past centuries dolls and children's toys are not an invention of today it is safe to say that their existence can be traced almost as far as the history of civilization the romans used to bury dolls and toys with the bodies of their little ones or place them in the funereal urn a usage that has preserved for us specimens of these tiny objects that have drawn smiles from young lips closed and sealed centuries ago together with these relics are other images that illustrate the history of costumes like the dolls the statuettes offered to temples and churches as ex votos and those used in the construction of the old presepio birth of christ scene the christmas eve representations of the bethlehem scene these wooden dolls and statuettes are not only artistic in themselves but are dressed in stuffs of their epoch very often cut in the fashion of the time some of these collections have really been excellent commentaries on the history of fashion and domestic customs of past ages among the few important collections we may quote as an example that of madame agar exhibited by this celebrated french artist several years ago in the palais de l'industrie now demolished madame agar's collection was very complete and illustrative of fashion and life in holland centuries ago 
the collection had originally belonged to the infant princess, the daughter of William of Orange and Nassau. Not only was it extremely artistic, containing several interiors of Dutch houses with inmates and accurate details suggesting a painting by Turberg or Tenier, but it represented all kinds of expression of 17th century Dutch life. Madame Agar came into possession of this fine collection under the following circumstances. Returning from one of her artistic tours in Belgium, she visited the city of Ghent and found the collection in the hands of a gentleman to whom she had been introduced upon her arrival. She offered to buy it, but the owner refused all offers, declaring that he did not wish to part with the precious collection. However, after having heard Madame Agar at the theatre one evening, he was so taken by her art that he wrote to the actress the very same night, Come to fetch my toys, I offer them to you, they are yours. There is no question of fakes in this branch either. The difficulty of finding old stuffs and linen with which to garb the figures is sufficient to discourage the trade, especially when one remembers how few customers the imitator would hope to attract. The art of tapestry weaving is the most complete of the class. Although technique may play its part in constituting expert knowledge, it is certainly subordinate to the artistic qualities necessary to perfect connoisseurship. Faking plays no part in this field, at least not the conspicuous part that it plays in painting and other artistic products likely to attract rich amateurs. This is easily understood when one takes into consideration the time, patience and money needful to the making of tapestry. It costs something like £80 a square yard. The imitator also knows that it would be a waste of time and money to fake old tapestries, as any expert can tell modern work from old. The apparatus has hardly undergone any essential change, it is true, but the materials are so different from formerly that fairly tolerable imitations can only be given in the case of repairs to old pieces. On account of the great cost of modern tapestry, the few existing factories either belong to the state or potentates, or they are supported by the lavish encouragement of some modern Mycenaeus. As we have said, the difference between the work of modern and ancient tapestry does not lie in a difference of process, unchanged in essentials since the Egyptian dynasties, but rather in the impossibility of obtaining materials like the old ones. Although some unscrupulous dealers do palm off overly repaired pieces of tapestry on foolish novices, the repair of tapestry is no faking after all, for the decorative character of the fabric fully justifies the amending and restoration of missing parts, and, unlike painting, the work does not bear its individual imprint. It is our duty, however, to warn the neophyte that the repairs are very seldom pointed out by dealers, and that it is absolutely necessary for the collector to train his eye in order to be able to detect the modern parts from the old and to know how much must be bought as antique and how much as modern. This is not so difficult as it may appear. The modern parts are worked in with the needle, and although the threads have generally been specially dyed, as the usual colours now on sale are very rarely suitable, there is a slight difference in the final effect. Nothing to offend the eye, even when closely examined, but enough to warn the expert of the size of the repaired piece. Sometimes the repair of tapestries uses a method which, in our opinion, comes under the head of faking. This consists of recolouring faded parts with watercolours or tempera. Some of this touching up is really cleverly done, at other times it is so clumsy that one wonders how even a novice can be taken in. If there is any suspicion that the tapestry has been coloured, a practical test is the displacement of the threads with a needle as the fresh colours are generally laid on with a brush and never penetrate between the threads where the old faded colour is visible. Incredible as it may seem, some tapestries are touched up with pastel. This was sometimes done even in the 18th century to disguise defects and crudeness of tone and now it is practised to deceive the eye by making a better match between the old and the new parts. Of course, pastel work is easily detected if one is allowed to rub the part, but this is not always feasible, especially at public sales where the tapestry is hung on the wall, sometimes very high up, on purpose to defy close inspection. 
there is also a method of fixing the pastel retouch with an atomizer and a certain liquid sold in paris but even these means are not so effective as milk and tempera and hard rubbing with a white cloth will always reveal the deception when pastel has been used rugs particularly oriental rugs belong in a way to the same family as tapestry and may be classified with it there is a difference however being less complicated in character and for the most part adorned only with the geometrical patterns and rudimentary arabesques rugs are imitated with greater facility things do not change so quickly in the east as in western countries and there the old weaving apparatus is still in use and materials are only just beginning to be imported from europe a large field is thus opened up to imitation and to a certain extent to faking also it is nevertheless hard to deceive experts and specialists keen-eyed and accustomed to distinguish between different kinds and to judge of age they are also able to detect modern frauds but alas good experts are rare and conceited collectors abound and for this reason fraud is rampant and remunerative even in this field those buying rugs for the sake of having a collection and not to furnish their houses with a comfortable and highly artistic luxury are advised to place themselves in the hands of an expert it will save time and trouble an eclectic collector however gifted will rarely consent to go deeply into this branch as the mastery of it implies great sacrifice of time and the boredom of learning a difficult language things that prove no obstacle to the passionate lover of the specialty but tedious and irksome to the general art lover following an erratic course in this chapter we will now pass on to books manuscripts and autographs a branch with many devotees and all kinds of collectors in which trickery and faking find an almost incredibly large sphere of action book collectors are of two kinds the one who prizes the work for the rarity of the edition and the other who is attracted by the binding the former is the true book collector the latter is really only a collector of rare and artistic bindings the two preferences do not mutually exclude one another of course and when found together offer the most complete kind of book collector it might be imagined that imitations in this branch would be confined to such pieces as only require the faker's shrewdness and imitative skill and not the great amount of work and money demanded by the reproduction of a whole edition but this is not the case as soon as fashion sovereign and despotic in this department also taste and art being secondary sets a value on what is called a rare edition false ones find that the work pays and imitations are thrown upon the market at once about the end of the eighteenth century a specialty was made in lyon of reproducing all the rare editions of racine's works while rouen acquired a certain notoriety in faking old volumes of moliere with every detail carefully and accurately copied quality of the paper the type decorative initials tail pieces etc that the labour was worth the trouble and expense is amply proved by the high prices that some original editions have fetched the first edition of moliere's works dated sixteen sixty nine was sold in paris for fifteen thousand francs at monsieur guy pellion's sale separate works bearing various dates were sold le tartuffe sixteen sixty nine for two thousand two hundred francs le misanthrope for one thousand two hundred and twenty francs and a few volumes below this price fashion having set extravagant prices the original edition of moliere's works was sold at seventy to a hundred francs apiece at bertin's sale eighteen eighty five old incomplete editions have been completed and for the late comers not in time for this half genuine articles full and first-class imitations are provided missing pages of rare volumes incunabula or precious highly prized editions are often supplied by the most skilful pen and ink work it is surprising to see how well the clever calligraphic artist can imitate the printed characters and how carefully and faithfully the missing pages are copied from some complete edition in a damaged edition it is generally the frontispiece that is missing or the ornamental title on the first page 
Some of the latter are true works of art and require most artistic penmanship for their reproduction. The illusion is nevertheless often complete. Paul Udall tells an amusing story of an expert who had not noticed that one of the pages of a certain work was a clever piece of penmanship later added, but to whom the secret was revealed by circumstantial evidence which saved him from being cheated. The work was so admirably done that the expert had not detected it to be pen work till he happened to notice a wormhole in the parchment of that page, whereas the preceding and following pages bore no hole. As it is impossible for a worm to reach a page in the middle of a book without boring through the others, he surmised that the hole must have been there when the page was done, that the page was a later edition, in fact. Once suspicious, it is easy to ascertain the truth. A closer examination showed Monsieur Perquet, such was the name of the expert, that the page in question was handwork and not print. It is true that nowadays, by means of photo-mechanical reproductions, old books, characters and illustrations can be imitated to perfection, and there are also mills that can supply all sorts of old-fashioned paper to order, as near as possible to a given sample. Experts claim, however, that such fakes are only dangerous for the inexperienced collector, that a magnifying glass reveals the action of the acid in a sort of scalloped edge to the ink lines, and that, although well imitated, the paper has a different grain when closely examined, etc. But it is, of course, understood that fakes are not as a rule intended to baffle the skill of the expert, but rather to take advantage of the inexperienced. The expert who gives his attention chiefly to the bindings of the books needs to be more of an artist than the other. We know that editions, too, have their elegancy, forms and tasteful simplicity needing, as it were, an artistically trained eye to enjoy their beauty and appreciate their value. But compared with bookbinding, their artistic quality seems to be of a more restricted kind. In bookbinding, art in all its decorative eloquence appears to claim full rights. There are bindings of past centuries, more especially in Paris, where bookbinding has always been a grand art, that are really chef d'oeuvre. As usual, it is the unwary who in this branch also pays the highest tribute to fakery. From the Grolier bindings down to the last specimens of the 18th century, imitation has a wide field of action for its versatility, but according to experts, the most exploited period is that running from the early years of the 17th century to the end of the 18th, one of the most difficult to imitate, and yet one of the most profitable. There are, of course, various ways of faking old bindings. Many have tried to fake the whole, beginning with the fabrication of the ornaments cut into iron, which are used to stamp the gilt ornaments on leather or parchment. In the opinion of the connoisseurs of Paris, where these imitations appear to find their best market, they are far from convincing, being only intended for such as seek a certain decorative quality without pretending to be experts or collectors. Specialists say there are imitations of a far more dangerous character, those composed of various genuinely antique parts, those relying upon some authentic element in the process of making, and original bindings fitted to other books, which are thus embellished and enriched, fetch higher prices. The first of the above operations knows no limits but those set by the material. It may be a question of using old leather or aged parchment, or of using old labels, or of taking advantage of the characteristic coloured lining papers that modern industry reproduces fairly well. Here we have, in fact, the usual composite style with which a fanciful binding is made or a book put together out of various elements that are perfectly genuine but belong to different sources. The second manner of faking in decorating the cover of a book is to use some old iron stamps for the impress on the leather of the binding. Some of these old implements that have escaped destruction are now used to advantage, especially to stamp decorative coats of arms on imitation antique bindings, so that the buyer should think the books have come straight from the former library of a nobleman. The faker has used this trick successfully with Americans particularly. 
In this way the stamps of the Sacré de Louis XV, which are, apparently, still in existence, have been used as decoys on fine bindings, as well as that of the Rohan Chabot family coat of arms, perpetuating the supposition that books belonging to that illustrious family are still on the market. The third method is called in French rambotage, and consists, as we have said, of transferring covers from one book to another. There are some good editions that have lost their covers and some worthless books with fine bindings. Fakery repairs this injustice of fate by transferring the good binding to the more meritorious book, a simple act of justice invariably rewarded in the world of fakery by the large sum that can be asked for the edition thus treated. There are naturally many ways to discover the bindings that have in one way or other received the paternal and not at all disinterested caress of the faker. But the best and safest way, shall we ever tire of repeating it, is to train one's eye to that helpful synthesis of judgment called experience. Newly coloured and patinated leather does not stand rubbing with a damp cloth like the old does. Modern gilding and modern stamping imitating antique designs are heavier and less clean cut, as well as not so rich, qualities best understood by comparing modern work with the old, for although the differences are slight they are, nevertheless, plain to the experienced eye accustomed to comparing old and new. Even rambotage, the most difficult to detect, may be found by examining the way one part is joined to the other, the peculiarities of the work, etc. All that can be said, however, to put the neophyte on his guard who may imagine that hints from books or special works on the subject are sufficient to assist him is, go slow, and if you are really anxious to have a good collection and prepared to pay good prices, in the beginning ask the man who knows for his help. Experto crede. It is obvious that no artistic temperament, taste or knowledge of art is necessary in order to become a collector of autographs. This class of collector, who may boast an uninterrupted line from scholars to specialists, has neither the assistance nor complicity of art. Consequently, the faker, who inevitably follows suit, must have a knowledge of history in order to avoid historical blunders. He must be acquainted with particulars connected with the personage whose autograph is to be forged, and above all, must be an expert imitator of other people's handwriting. In fact, in him the art of forging signatures must be brought to the highest perfection. For here documents are to be forged, a succession of calligraphic characters and idiosyncrasies far more difficult of execution than a mere signature on a false cheque. The aptitude of a bank clerk gives promise of a good expert of this subject. Studies of various papers according to the epoch is not of such assistance here to the expert as in the case of books, for there is still plenty of old-fashioned paper on the market, enough of it at least to bear a few lines from a celebrated man. The chief quality needed is experience gained by comparing originals with forgeries, or better still, such familiarity with a given man's handwriting that its genuineness can be judged at sight, as a bank clerk does with a signature. There are some artists also in this class, but not only is it rarer, but their work deals less with autographs properly so called than old documents mostly on parchment with illuminations, etc. Stamp collecting hardly comes within our sphere and represents rather a minor departure of connoisseurship. Several books have been written on the subject, many with valuable hints as to prices and with reproductions of the best samples, etc. We would warn our readers who may perchance be interested that every stamp of value has been faked, that, strange to say, some of these fifty-year-old fakes fetch handsome prices and flourishing factories have been established to supply not only the rare specimens already acknowledged as such, but to produce at a few hours' notice any sample despotic fashion may suddenly raise to the rank of a rarity. Art plays so small a part that the way to become an expert on the subject is to become an expert. Beyond this, which is only in appearance an idem per idem, there is very little to be done. Experience consists of being familiar with the original, 
the kind of paper used, the colours, peculiarities and also defects, particularly the defects, as when the stamps were printed that are now rare, the art of printing was in its infancy compared with our times. There is no occasion to speak of minor fancy collections that, as usual, form links between the true collector and the man with a mania. Even in these minor branches there may be more than one interesting collection, such, for instance, as that of General Van Damme, who left his relatives no fewer than 60,000 pipes, and Baron Oscar de Watterville and others. Art plays no great part in these minor expressions of curio collecting, and science also occupies but a limited field. One axiom may be given, however, which holds good for all classes of collecting, whether artistic, scientific, or anything else, and that is that as soon as the prices of certain articles come under the nomenclature of fancy prices, through fashion or merit, the faker is ready to hand. In the Paris world of fakers, a larger world than the outsider may imagine, an amusing anecdote is told. Learning the high prices paid by astronomers for bolides, an inveterate faker called upon a well-known chemist to propose a partnership for the production of imitations of meteorites. Even if an invention, the anecdote gives the full size of the faker's spirit of enterprise. End of chapter 24Chapter 25 of The Gentle Art of Faking by Ricardo Nobili. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jordan Watts, Oxfordshire. Chapter 25 Summing Up With some show of reason, Swift affirmed that all sublunary happiness consists in being well deceived. We are perfectly aware that this book does not support Swift's ethics of happiness, for while agreeing that the English satirist's theory may hold good on a great many occasions, we claim an exception for collectors as a class. In the world of art, art lovers and collectors, to be well deceived means to be living in a fool's paradise, a most costly dwelling which promises no eternal joy. On the contrary, the happiness derived from being well deceived in this case is generally not only of very short duration, but inflicts smarting wounds to pride and pockets. In the world at large there seems to exist a certain benevolence towards deluded ones, which makes it at times possible for the well deceived to be the only one of his entourage unaware that he has been duped. In the world of collectors, such a thing is almost an impossibility, for, to quote a well-known French art lover, After pictures by Michelangelo and specimens of Medici ware, the rarest thing to find with collectors is kindliness. The same art lover assures that in this peculiar world not only is kindliness, bienveillance, rare, but the opposite sentiment has been developed almost to the point of genius. Collectors, especially first-rate collectors who have finally emerged into fame through the complex resultant of a good eye, shrewdness and extreme skill in fencing with strong competitors, have a regular talent for flavouring bitter pills for deceived friends and comrades with troublesome innuendos and smarting disclosures, for, as the above-quoted connoisseur declares, they have a way of praising with praise that exasperates and with homicidal compliments and there is a type of collector who knows his repertory by heart a man who is a toriador raffiné il massacre artistement what the neophyte can do to avoid being artistically massacred as the french connoisseur puts it semi-euphemistically is difficult to say books and special treatises may explain the nature of the deceit point out the dangers awaiting him and show how traps are laid and how they work but to pretend to become a truly safe buyer on the security of knowledge gathered from books and manuals would be like attempting the ascent of some dangerous peak on the strength of wisdom drawn from works on alpine climbing the rudiments of the arts do not concern so much the knowledge of how to buy as of how not to buy, how to resist, namely, the first impulse, which in an inexperienced art lover proves to be one of the worst dangers. 
the slow prudent method must be learned of not listening to first impulses till the first impulses are supported by something better than the innate conceit of a beginner we know of course that there may be occasions when even a beginner may have cause to regret not having listened to a first impulse but such a thing is further from the general rule than the beginner claims and in any case it pays in the long run to let a good chance slip rather than risk becoming the possessor of some expensive would-be chef d'oeuvre in addition during the early stages in particular a certain amount of scepticism must temper a too ready belief in what the dealer has to say or show in support of his assertion there will come a time when experience will help the collector to detect more easily than at first alluring suggestive information etc naturally it is not all dealers who are on the watch to take advantage of the beginner on the contrary there are more honest dealers in the antique market than one would think but the trouble is that the dishonest ones seem to be the four to be ever there ready to confront the inexperienced novice and their noisy deceits become far more known than good honest dealing causing perplexity in some collectors so that it may be they disbelieve the man who is telling the truth and give credence to the liar who being a perfect master in the art of misrepresentation seems to be honesty itself here too the determination to be rather sceptical as to documents letters pedigrees and mercantile evidence may lead the beginner to miss some good opportunity but the case is rare and such losses are as a rule amply covered in the summing up of the total cost of apprenticeship through not having paid for experience the extravagant price usually demanded in due time the art lover's ability to discern between dealing and dealing will be sharpened and he will be able to defend himself better this merely concerns dealing and experience in distinguishing the genuine from the fake but even supposing perfection has been attained in this part the fact does not necessarily imply qualification as a connoisseur collector expert or even simple lover of art a collection may be composed of genuine articles and yet be a poor one utterly devoid of artistic merit or even commercial value of importance to have paid a high price there is no guarantee of merit there are as a matter of fact perfectly genuine paintings for which extravagant fancy prices have been paid but which in the eyes of a true connoisseur are not worth the nail they hang on it is almost impossible to conceive that experience in distinguishing the genuine from the false should be acquired without the attainment of some artistic progress prompting discrimination between poor art and mediocre and mediocre art and fine art yet this artistic side is the most difficult to develop to that perfection and semi-intuition of the beautiful so necessary to the real and first-rate connoisseur by what method this artistic side may be perfected in the collector is still more difficult to tell for in this direction experience only counts to a certain extent in fact as regards this artistic education of the connoisseur we are inclined to repeat with taine in his philosophie de l'art precepts well two might be given first to be born with genius that is your parents affair not mine second to work a good deal to bring it out and that is not my business either here too then actual methods are out of the question they are perforce of such a general character as to be no more use than telling a blind man to keep in the middle of the road because there are ditches on either side it is further not uncommon for contrary systems to lead to equally happy results according to the person employing them one antiquary when undecided as to the genuineness of a painting used to have a photograph of it taken for he said he could easily detect the traits of forgery on seeing the work in black and white with all the colours eliminated or to put it in his own words the faked side sweats out another connoisseur held exactly the contrary theory declaring that he could tell nothing from photos but needed the colours to help to detect the genuineness or fraud of the painting perhaps the former had an artistic temperament based chiefly upon the charm of form while the latter was what in art is termed a colourist 
In addition, at times another misleading cause may be added which comes under the form of intervening suggestion and may put even a highly gifted artistic temperament off the scent. Perhaps an example will best illustrate this peculiar interference, which is not only of a circumstantial order, as we have seen in another part of this book, but may be the result of an unconscious parti pris. Some years ago, when Mr. Stanford White imported works of art and antiques for his millionaire patrons, a Mr. X, who owned a fine mansion on Fifth Avenue, very much admired an early 15th century single andiron that was among the imported goods. He wished, however, to have a pair. The suggestion that a modern copy should be made from the only remaining original at first disgusted him, for everyone knows how easily American collectors buy imitations for originals and how disgusted they are if the dealer honestly says that a certain work is an imitation. On being assured that the imitation should be perfect, the new piece was finally ordered and the antiquary arranged for an artistically exact copy of the ancient andiron to be made in Italy. However, possibly because not wishing to be suspected of concocting modern antiques, or for some other reason, the Italian firm sent a perfect copy of the original in a brand new condition, suggesting that a certain Italian artist living in New York should give it the proper patina, as he was fully initiated in the cryptic art of making new objects look as old as might be desired. The art critic chosen to come and judge of the final result of the work was, as the artist knew, rather distrustful of Italians and their tricks, as he put it. The Italian artist did the work as well as it could be done, and knowing that it was going to be judged side by side with the original, the hardest test that can be inflicted upon an imitation, he managed to cheat the art critic by being excessively frank and honest, taking advantage of his prejudice against Italians and a probable momentary mental attitude. The two pieces were shown in the artist's atelier, the imitation being placed by the artist in the full light and the original in the most benevolent corner, far from the window in a half shade. The first thought that passed through the art critic's brain as he entered the studio was that the tricky Italian had put the imitation where the light was less strong and the shade more benevolently helpful. Very good, he remarked, but of course even when not in the full light an imitation is always an imitation. But that is the original, replied the artist, for to make his positive assertion the more definite the critic had been pointing to the wrong piece. A stony silence followed. The story ends here and we do not know whether the critic ever forgave the artist his honest trick. Knowing that the art critic was a real connoisseur, a good exception to the class, we are quite sure that his judgment was perverted by the preconceived notion that the Italian had placed the imitation in the shade and thus had hardly let his artistic temperament and knowledge of art come into play in forming an opinion or rather the opinion was already formed and too quickly expressed by a semi-subconscious process of reasoning that had nothing in common with art judgment. So many are the special cases and so little the assistance generally given to newcomers that the safest method in conclusion is to have no actual method, to watch and study one's own temperament, value the first results objectively, to be ready to learn as much as possible from experience under whatever form it comes and finally, like in so many cases of human life and possibilities, to work out one's own salvation. In this way, even if not called to the Olympus of the elect, the art lover will certainly reduce his bad bargains to a minimum. Bad bargains in the way of buying the wrong things as far as the genuineness of the article is concerned, as well as with regard to its artistic worth. With this he must rest satisfied, for, as we gladly repeat once more with the Nestor of French connoisseurs, beware of the collector who never makes a mistake. The strongest is he who makes the fewest mistakes. As we have seen, the genus Curia, Curio Hunter, comprises a most complex and multiform assembly of types. From the distinct ages of Roman dominion down to our times, collectomania has produced characters graduated in originality from the grotesque to the tragic, the false to the genuine, the sordid or wicked like Mark Antony and Verres to noble representatives like Julius Caesar, Augustus and Agrippa. 
Curiously enough, the noble type of collector and the usefulness of his mission have generally escaped the observation of writers of all ages. They seem to have been quicker to see the grotesque side of collector mania than its utility. Marshall, Juvenal, Pliny, Seneca and others are not dissimilar in their remarks from, say, Molière and La Bruyère. So strong is the inclination to place the types in a grotesque setting, to make them the target of witty sallies, that they very often mistake oddities for signs of idiocy, idiosyncrasies and peculiarities for craziness, and, carrying their analysis no further, they let loose the vein of their satire on people whose passion for collecting has been of extreme use to the intellectual world, greatly assisting progress and the civilization of humanity. Just like a donkey beholding a liar, jibes an old Greek epigram in allusion to collectors who, while buying eagerly, give so little time, or none at all, to the enjoyment of the artistic merits of their acquisitions. Addressing one of his contemporaries, who had a passion for collecting manuscripts and volumes but no inclination to read them, Lucian remarks, Why so many literary works? Do you collect them in order to lie on the learned thoughts of others, or to paste the parchment of the volumes to your skin? With it all you will not become a jot more learned, a monkey is always a monkey, even though covered with gilded garments. To follow up the special case of book collecting to which Lucian's remark casually leads us, the same sentiment as that of the Greek writer was entertained centuries later by Petrarch and Robert Estienne. The former was a poet and bibliophile, the latter a famous printer, author of the Tesoros Linguae Latinae. The two did not spare satires on the mere collector of books. A like attitude is taken towards Mazarin by a mediocre poet of La Fronde, who reproaches the cardinal with collecting books without reading them, the same reproach that contemporary writers make to Maglia Becci, a passionate collector of rare editions who never went further in a book than the title page. Yet, to confine ourselves to these alone, to Mazarin is due one of the finest libraries of Paris which still bears his name, and by his careful patient work, Maglia Becci was the founder of the Maglia Becciana, now the National Library of Florence, a marvel and model of historical character to other more modern institutions of the kind. These two persistent and passionate book collectors have certainly contributed more to science and its progress than many of those scholars who made fun of their hobby. It must be taken into consideration that collecting, after all, is a passion, at times a deep and firmly rooted one, and that passion, like love, in its most exalted expression does not represent normality. But while on the one hand presenting qualities of an intuitive character can be coupled with oddities and idiosyncrasies, frequently the inevitable heritage of originality. Hannibal, who stored his money in the hollow of the bronze statues of his collection, Sulla, who put to death citizens to seize their rare pieces of art, and Julius Caesar, who travelled with his cherished objects of virtu, are known to us as collectors mostly through their peculiarities the amusing anecdotal side of a passion, certain to be exploited by a writer, be he chronicler or historian. Yet to go back to the unjustified and indiscriminating spirit of satirists, both of ancient and more recent times, which tends to consider the collector a maniac or fool, many a Greek or Roman chef d'oeuvre of art has nevertheless been spared to our admiration by the patient persistence and art-loving care of collectors. It would indeed be interesting to follow the passage of some of the most noted specimens of past art. If one could trace the true history of each one of these objects in all its details, it would perhaps give us the history of the collecting passion together with the tangible proof of its merits and utility. It would indeed not only be interesting but also instructive to know the vicissitudes of some of the works of art that have come down to us. The few hints existing as to the lineage of owners of some of the most famous pieces of Greek and Roman art certainly promise interest, even though marred at times by the fact that much of the information rests upon the vague authority of tradition, or is strongly doubted by modern criticism. 
We owe, it is more than possible, the Venus of the Hermitage to Caesar, the well-known Weta has almost certainly been saved to our admiration by Lucullius, just as Cicero may be thanked for the Demosthenes and the collecting passion of Sallust has handed down to us the Faun, the Hermaphrodite and the Vase of the Villa Borghese. These remarks of a well-known French collector who mainly notes works contained in the Louvre Museum might be extended to many other collections, especially those of Rome, where several of the works of art have old historical records of undisputed character. From the Renaissance down to our own days, the pedigrees of celebrated works of art are not only surer, but present at times a less interrupted line of descent. With such, it is not uncommon to find a rare object pass from one collector to another, receiving the same care and consideration as though passing from father to son as a cherished heirloom, and it is, in fact, passing from one to another member of the same family, the family bound by an identical burning passion, that of collecting. As to the essence of this passion, so often confounded with mania, a mistake calling forth the following comment from a French collector, Confondre la manie avec la curiosité, c'est prendre l'histoire pour l'amour, la belle Hélène pour l'Iliade. We should like to quote Gersin, one of the few men who as art dealer and collector in one might be styled private dealer in modern phrase, impersonated the passion, as we have said, in its highest expression among the many collectors of the 18th century. It must be understood, of course, that Gerson, one of these maniacs in, say, La Bruyère's opinion, was a representative of those passionate collectors who subordinate every other passion of mankind to the one they have made the sole aim of their lives, a cueur, says this unilateral lover, but not hobbyist collector, has the advantage of not falling an easy prey to the many passions so familiar to the human family, the curiosité fills as the empty spaces of his leisure moments. Entertained by his cherished possessions, he has time only for working the advantage of his curiosité, and his cabinet becomes the centre of all his pleasures, and the seat of all his passions. The outsider and halfway insider will agree that this is a trifle too much. But, after all, the great collectors who have left to the museums of their countries fortunes that would have been lost but for their intense passion, treasures of art left by the ignorance to the doom of decay, have all felt, more or less, the burning passion described by Gerson, in the passage quoted, which goes on to assert that a true paradise awaits the perfect collector, who is never bored and never the prey of spleen. Without discussing the promises held out by Gerson as the perfect collector is, to our knowledge, rare, let us state that our book does not hope to urge any reader on to the perfection that ushers into Gerson's bliss. But if the brief glimpse we have given of collector mania with its pleasures and dangers should convince some really passionate lover of art that collecting has a nobler aim than that of mere pleasure, if we should discourage a Tongilius or Paulus, or if this work should scare some modern clarinus and do away with a noisy, useless, up-to-date Trimalchus, we shall feel that the purpose of the book has been justified to some extent. End of chapter 25 and part 3 and end of The Gentle Art of Faking by Ricardo Novelli.